the wax crocodile will be presented in a story form. Once upon a time, as all good stories begin, a pharaoh, accompanied by his counselors and servants, paid a visit to the villa of his chief scribe, behind which there was a garden with a stately summer house and a broad artificial lake. One of the servants of the pharaoh was a handsome young man who catches the eye of the scribe's wife. She sends him gifts, and they begin to have secret meetings at the summer house and swim in its lake. The chief butler informs the scribe of his wife's affair, and the scribe in turn asks the butler to bring him a magic box. Inside was a small wax crocodile that he placed in the hands of his butler, saying, cast this image into the lake behind the youth when he next bathes himself. The lovers were together in the lake the next day, and the butler stealthily put the wax croc into the water, which immediately gave it life. It became a great crocodile that seized the handsome man suddenly and took him away. Seven days passed, and the scribe tells the pharaoh of the wonder that had been done, and made a request his majesty should accompany him to the villa lake. The pharaoh did so, and when they both stood beside the lake in the garden, the scribe spoke magic words, bidding the crocodile to appear, and as he commanded, so did it do. The great reptile came out of the water, carrying the handsome man in its jaws. The pharaoh was filled with wonder, and the scribe related onto him what had happened while the handsome man stood waiting. Could have taken his chance to run, but I guess not. The pharaoh bids onto the crocodile once again to take the handsome man into the depths, and neither are ever seen again. Then the pharaoh gave the command that the wife of the scribe should be seized, and on the north side of the house she was bound to a stake and burned alive. Now, if you want to hear more wild stories like this, I recommend you subscribe to The Hive. For number 9, let's talk about the lore of the Catwoman God. Cats were very important to the ancient Egyptians and were even considered to be demi-deities. Not only did they protect the crops and slow the spread of disease by killing rodents, but they were also thought to be the physical form of the goddess Beset. The Egyptian goddess of domesticity, childbirth, the home, women's secrets, women's physical pleasure, fertility, and of course, cats. It's for this reason she's depicted as a slender and lanky woman with a cat's head. Beset was the daughter of Ra, the sister of Sekhemet, the wife of Ptah, and the mother of Mihos. It's believed that every day she would ride through the sky with her father, the sun god, and watch over and protect him. At night she would turn into a cat and continue her duty of protecting Ra, but from his greatest enemy, the serpent Apep. And since we're already talking about it, number 8 will be the serpent Apep. According to the legend, Apep was a powerful serpent deity who resided in the underworld and embodied the universe's destruction and chaos. Each night, when Ra's son Bo had to pass through the underworld before re-emerging at dawn, Apep would absolutely hound the ship in an attempt to prevent the sun from rising. Ra, the sun god and king of the gods, fought Apep every night, and the battle was always extremely intense, required all the other gods' help, and lasted the whole night. So to aid Ra in battle, the Egyptians would build wax representations of Apep and melt them in the sun. Finally, it's Beset who conquers and destroys the serpent Apep. During one of these nightly battles, Beset, being the goddess of cats, aided in Apep's defeat by utilizing her powers in a different way than she'd done before. Assuming the form of a lioness, she jumps the serpent, shredding him to pieces and scattering the bones over the underworld. From then on, Ra was tormented nightly no longer. For number 7, you're going to hear the oldest origin of Cinderella and her red slipper. Rhodopis, as she's known to modern storytellers, was a Thradican Egyptian woman slighted by fate and rewarded by royalty. First sold in Aegea, Rhodopis is passed through owners before winding up in Egypt. The Egyptian man who possesses her treats her incredibly fair. He gives her lovely homes, lavish her with other gifts, but he spent most of his time sleeping. So she's sitting on the bank of the Canopic Nile, watching robes when a falcon suddenly snatches her sandal. Rhodopis is in awe, for she knew it was the god Horus who had taken her shoe, but wondering what the Horus appearance could mean. Unbeknownst to her, however, the falcon had taken it to Memphis and dropped the sandal in the lap of none other than the pharaoh Amasis himself. Possessed by the sandal's simplicity, but beautiful red color and being an obvious sign from the god Horus, the king sent his men in all directions of the country's quest of all directions of the country in quest of the woman who wore it. According to Greek geographer and historian Strabo in his geography book 17.33, she was found in the city of Nocrates. Hearing the trumpets and gongs of the emperor, she had hidden in the bushes while other girls tried to force their feet into her sandal. But the emperor spots her and requests she come out and try it. Naturally, Cinderella style, it only fits her, and she pulled the matching one from her robes. The pharaoh and Rhodopis are united by the god Horus, and the servant girl becomes the next queen of Egypt, to whom Herodotus, Diodorus, and Strabo say the third pyramid of Giza was attributed to. For number six, we're getting another Grecian influenced myth, that of Oedipus and the Sphinx. So the legend of the Sphinx is a famous Egyptian myth about a creature with the head of a human woman and the body of a lion. Sometimes the Sphinx is also depicted to have wings, but that's more of a Greco-Roman component. According to the story, the Sphinx was said to have been sent by the sun god Ra to guard the entrance of the city of Thebes. The Sphinx naturally, as you may know, guarded Thebes not only with its might, but with its mind, presenting a riddle for 
all those who broached it. And to anyone who could not answer the riddle, they would be killed. What was the riddle? What walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening? If you don't know the answer yet, I actually encourage you to pause the video and try some guesses before we continue. Let's see if the Sphinx would give you the slice and dice. Okay, so the answer is, drum roll please, a human who crawls on all fours as a baby, walks on two legs as an adult, and uses a cane in old age. Tricky, right? So the myth goes that a young prince named Oedipus, yes, the one who marries and does stuff with his mom, uh, came upon the Sphinx while traveling and he asked the riddle. Oedipus was the first person to be able to answer correctly, which angered and confused the crap out of the Sphinx, causing it to take its own life in a panic. However, some versions of the myth, the Sphinx was said to have been turned to stone by the gods. Now segueing back into the gods, number five will be about Osiris and Isis. Egyptian ruler god Ori Osiris and his wife Isis is one of the most well-known and revered myths. Osiris was renowned for his intelligence and generosity, two things his envious brother Set lacked. Vying to be king, Set lured Osiris to the Nile, where he enticed Osiris into a coffin and tossed it into the river to be swept away. Devoted wife Isis diligently searches for Osiris and discovers the coffin near Balbos, which is in modern day Lebanon. Isis returned with Osiris's body, but concealed it amongst the reeds of the Nile. However, Set had been tracking her and steals the coffin back and chops Osiris's corpse up and throws the pieces everywhere. Isis persisted in her quest for her husband's body. She finds all the pieces, reconstructed Osiris, and bombed his body, got pregnant off of it really quick, and brought his soul back to life with the assistance of her sister Nephesis. Osiris became the deity of the afterlife, ruling over the dead in the underworld. So naturally, that would bring us to number four, which is Horus versus Set. The story is told in the Chester Beatty Papyrus number one, Contendings of Horus and Seth, which dates back to the early Middle Kingdom, but the myth will most likely has origins even earlier than that. So upon bombing Osiris, his son Horus is conceived and then born. Thoth and Shu declare Horus the rightful ruler of Egypt, but Ra argued that Seth was more powerful, therefore deserved the throne. So cue a massive battle. First, they have a hippo breath holding competition. Isis gets involved and as a result, Horus feels betrayed by his mama and cuts her head off. Then Seth gouges Horus' his eyes out while he's asleep and Hathor has to return them. The judges wanted the two gods to make amends since crap is getting petty. So they do, but the wily Seth decided to seduce Horus for a scheme. Some very R-rated stuff goes down between the men, but Horus is smart and collects the seed of Seth instead of having it go somewhere else. He brings the seed to his mother, Isis, who proceeds to freak out and cut off his hands. And then she collects some of Horus' seed in a bucket for revenge against her brother Seth for trying to trick Horus. How? She goes to Seth's garden, finds his favorite lettuce, and dumps the seed all over it. So here comes Seth, post lettuce lunch, declaring to the judge council he had performed the labor of a male against Horus, so he should be king. Horus is like, nah, -uh, I did it to him, and the other gods were like, okay, well, let's ask the seed then. So Seth's seed had been discarded by Isis in a marsh, and it responded from there. Well, Horus's seed, eaten on lettuce, replied from inside Seth. So Seth is pissed. He says they need to do another contest. It involves sailing stone boats down the Nile, and Horus cheats, making a wooden boat look like stone. Seth finds out, loses it, demolishes Horus's ship. Finally, enough is enough. They still have been duking it out for 80 years, and everyone is tired. The gods appeal to Osiris in the underworld as the final decision maker, and he obviously chooses his son Horus to rule, not the guy who killed him. Alrighty, up next is number three, and that is the weighing of the heart. According to the story, after death, a person's soul would be carried by the god Thoth to the Hall of Mat, where it would be judged by a panel of gods, including Anubis. Being the deity of embalming and mummification, Anubis played a significant role in the weighing of the heart ceremony. He was accountable for ensuring the deceased body was appropriately respected and readied for the afterlife, as it was he who operated the scales. My personal favorite depiction of this is seen in the TV series American Gods, which paints a visually stunning and poetic scene of Anubis weighing a heart. So the soul and the heart of the deceased would be weighed against the mat feather, which represented truth and justice. If the soul were pure and sinless, it would be permitted to enter the hereafter. But if the soul was laden with guilt, it would be devoured by a meat, a hideous beast comprised of a lion, crocodile, and hippo. This next story is a long-winded one. It's number two, the secret name of Ra. So Ra was was known by many names to the gods and humans alike, however he had one secret name which gave him his divine power. The goddess Isis sought equal power to Ra and devised a plan to obtain that secret name. Having grown old, Ra couldn't speak without spit running from his lips, and Isis one day collected the soil it fell upon. She baked it into the form of an invisible venomous serpent which she placed in the path of Ra. When the invisible serpent strikes him, burning venom runs through Ra who collapses in pain. He's brought to his bed and demands all his godly children come 
to him. His children run to his bed in sorrow, and unto Ra spake Isis, saying, I shall weave spells, I shall thwart thine enemy with magic. Lo, I shall overwhelm the serpent utterly in the brightness of thy glory. Thou must even now reveal thy secret name unto me, for verily thou canst be delivered from thy pain and distressed by the power of thy name. Hotter than fire burned the venom in the heart of Ra. Like raging flames, it consumed his flesh, and he suffered fierce agony. Isis waited and waited until Ra, desperate in pain, accedes. It is my will that Isis be given my secret name, and that it leave my heart and enter hers. When he had spoken thus, Ra vanished before the eyes of the gods. The sun boat was empty, and there was a thick darkness. Isis then received in her heart the secret name of Ra, and the mighty enchantress screamed out for the departure of Ra's venom and the relief of his agony. And so the god Ra was made whole once more. The venom departed from his body, and there was no longer pain in the heart or any sorrow. He and Isis were now equals. And we've made it to number one, which will be the heavenly cow. Arguably one of the most famous Egyptian legends, its most preserved version is found in the tomb of Seti the First. Ra was getting pretty up there in age, and mankind, his own creation, stirs up a rebellion against him because of it. Ra is deeply hurt. Mankind sought to kill him and assembled the pantheon of gods, asking their advice. Should he kill all of mankind as a punishment or just remove himself as they request? The gods bicker a bit, but the consensus is reached. Let thine eye go forth against those who are rebels in the kingdom, and it shall destroy them utterly. When it cometh down from heaven as Hathor, no human eye can be raised against it. Upon the advice of the council of God, Ra sends his daughter Hathor, the fiery protective sun eye, to kill the rebels. The goddess rejoiced in her work and drave over the land for so many nights that she waited in blood. Blood that begins to horrify Ra. The god repents, his anger fading, and he sought to save the rest of mankind from his daughter. His messengers run to fetch barley, which is turned into beer and mixed with the already spilled blood of man. He commands the jars then be spilled at the site where the vent for Hathor rested for the night. So that when Hathor awakens, her heart is made glad. She stooped down and in her literal bloodlust began to drink eagerly, not knowing the red fluid was not blood, but beer. By the time she finished, Hathor was too drunk to pay heed to any of mankind and returns to the palace to be with family as they ask her to. Ra, however, is now far too weary to remain among men. He settles down with that family and shares the news of his earthly departure for the sky and calls upon his father Nut and the goddess of the heavens Nut to aid him. Nut takes the form of the celestial cow and ascended up, carrying Ra to become the son of all earths. We're gonna start with how hippopotamuses love you too. One thing that many people don't realize is that the creature that kills the most people in Africa each year, quite literally their most dangerous creature on the continent, is not even a carnivore. It's the hippopotamus, as featured in that annoying Xmas song and that early 2000s Canadian commercial that had us all googling if house hippos are real. To really drill my point in, hippos are the only creature that actually ever scared Steve Irwin. Now, while they may not live on the Nile River anymore today, they certainly did back in the days of ancient Egypt and were sometimes considered a bad omen because of how dangerous they were. They could easily swamp boats, drag people under and drown them, and out of sheer regression, they could maul people to death with their huge mouths and teeth, even if they had no interest in eating them. As proven by King Tut and King Menes, who both got smoked by these animals while possibly out hunting them, which is something the upper class occasionally did. Call that immediate karma. But deadly creatures could be on a smaller physical scale. Rats and bugs. Most diseases that afflicted the ancient Egyptians, which they also happen to have very little protection from, were transferred by pests. Those who lived near the marshes used nets to protect themselves from the mosquitoes, netting around beds, doors, windows, you name it. They also had DIY pesticides for their homes, a solution of Notron or Dobbin and Debit, which is like a crushed charcoal. This mixed powder rub protected them from epidemics and vermin alike. The ancient Egyptians thought that the main reason for the pestilence of the year, which must be the prehistoric terms flu season, was the time of year when dryness and cracking of agricultural lands caused rats to surge up from it. It's also said that the papyrus Cellulier III, that on the 12th day of the first month of winter every year is when disease season began. Obviously they made the connection when you see rats you've got fleas, and when you've got fleas you've got plague. In ancient Egypt the fee of bringing a doctor was very expensive, it could be a copper ingot, a set of vessels, or even, you know, servitude women. This means that when the poor got sick, they would not be able to afford the doctor's fee, and as a result life expectancy was no more than 35 years for the peasant, while 
while the higher classes lived longer, reaching their 80s and 90s. So, how else do you conquer horrible bug? Why, by shaving every part of it. It was incredibly hot in ancient Egypt, and running showers only cameoed later in the dynasty. For this reason, finding ways to stay cool, stay hygienic, and also avoid awful pests like lice was very important. So, ancient Egyptians shaved their heads and the rest of their bodies clean, and we don't mean just the women either. Having smooth oiled legs, arms, and torsos became the Egyptian beauty standard for both sexes. Even for any women or people hearing this who know what it's like to shave more than the 4x4 four four inch face radius, it can be ridiculous to imagine the chore this must have been for everybody. Shaving your entire body regularly without modern razors, electric trimmers, wax, all while avoiding infection or scrapes on your skins with no water to help. This is where wigs come in. A lot of folks wonder how wigs have become so normalized in our world and ancient Egyptians, really quite a few African continents are the answer. They could be taken on and off, keep your head cool, and they can be tossed into a barrel to be soaked, cleaned, and deloused and worn again. And while I am on a horrible bug roll, worms. Anyone else in Canada forced to read that weird book in high school called The Troop with all those boys stuck on the island with the evil parasitic body infesting worms? No? Nobody? Alright, well while I go to therapy for those nightmares until I'm like 108, let me plant a brain worm on you. Back in the days of ancient Egypt, they didn't have the kind of footwear choices we have today. Most people only had very basic sandals and shoes for their everyday work and travel, so foot problems were common and there were ones that were more than just stepping on some shattered pottery or some some burnt tootsies from hot sand. Wading into water for whatever, whether it's work, a bath, even just for fun, they had the risk of a shit soma worm getting into their feet and then wreaking havoc on their internal organs, weakening the immune system. Or there's the genea worm, which would hitch a ride in your nose or mouth, travel through your body and eat a path down your leg muscle and lay eggs in them as it goes. They could also get regular old hookworms as well, which could cause iron deficiency, anemia, and all kinds of other love symptoms. Perhaps they should have used some of that magic ancient technology and made more protective footwear so I don't have to think about this for the rest of my night, but no. Huh. Okay, so that was awful. Instead of things that were consuming the ancient Egyptians, how about something they would consume? Sand. Lots of sand. And dude, it effed their teeth right up. Many of our ancient Egyptian videos mention of the incredible innovations Egyptians had in regards to their teeth. They were known for being one of the earliest cultures to use both toothpaste and toothbrushes as well. But this can give the wrong impression. This wasn't a fun little vanity invention, but one of necessity. Sure, they practically had no sugar in their diet, let alone acids, but ancient Egyptians lived in an extremely sandy environment, as we all know. And since they didn't have the insulation, and other vacuums and things we have today, the sand was pretty much everywhere in everything all the time. So yeah, ancient Egyptians were always getting grit in their food, especially their bread, which was the most common thing they ate. This, along with the regularly enjoyed beer, also full of sand, led to some really bad dental problems that they were constantly trying to find solutions for, such as their braces, tooth removal, infection care, and naturally, toothbrush and toothpaste invention. And why not wash all that sand down with a whole lot of flood water? Egyptians actually recorded measured and tracked the Nile River and to do so they created their own series of measurements, the Nilometer, and a governmental cataloging system that could track the Nile patterns through the centuries of information, the Palmero Stone. While the blessings of the Nile were many, there were such a thing as a little too much. Too high of a flood could destroy dikes, irrigation work, settlements, food stores, and livestock, increase epidemic diseases, and endanger seed stocks. Low or short floods didn't always reach some of the farmlands, which then as a result reduced the wetted area, the degree of soil saturation, and the amount of fertile silt deposited. But it would increase the salt concentration of the waters reaching the fields along the desert margins. This all reduced the cultivated area as well as the unit productivity, whether too wet, too dry, or too salty, and resulted in food crises ranging from food shortages to straight famine and plague. And naturally, the agriculture and fields were always the first affected by floods, which would immediately affect crop quality, its quantity, and thus income. Some theories mentioned that the decline after the dynasty and at the end of the old kingdom occurred because of food shortages and famines, resulting by the flow of inundation. In the tale of two brothers, when inundation confines the men and beasts within doors, the younger brother seats himself at the loom and weaves. Why? Well, this is my smooth segue into talking about how blue collar carried all. As it still does nowadays. Shout out to my blue collar workers, you're seen, essential, and loved. Anyways, to paint a picture, let me read a short segment of the instructions of Duokete, which dates back to the middle
little kingdom. The field hand cries out forever, his voice louder than the raven, his fingers have become ulcerous with an excess of stench. He is tired out and dealt a labor, he is in tatters. He is well among lions, but his experience is painful, the forced labor then is tripled. If he comes back from the marshes there, he reaches his house worn out, for the forced labor has ruined him. This is just one of the many very fun literary resources that detail the haggard existence of the Egyptian blue collared field. There was even an ancient Egyptian papyrus found and it turns out it's a letter from a scribe of Amun-Ra listing reasons to his son why he should become a scribe and nothing else because everything else sucks. In describing the miserable life of a herdsman, it said that they were all worn out with constant toil, bad food, and the dank air of their habitat. Lived near marshes with his cattle. He had no settlement, home, a misery, lonely reed hut, sheltered him at night and held all his worldly goods. A rush mat to sleep on and clay water jar and basket for his head. Sometimes the Nile would flood as discussed and destroy a farmer's whole career. When summer came and the fish left, fishermen had to find new jobs. When drought arrived, artisans and clay makers had to shift focus. To survive, you have to be a master of all crafts but with a limited education. Thank god you're only struggling to eat, fighting disease and climate disasters all while getting taxed out the wazoo. So biographies of the Middle Kingdom tombs shed light on the tax collecting activities of nomarchs. While an important administrative text, the papyrus Brooklyn de deals with the forced labor. From this we know until the first millennium BC, taxes were paid in the form of grain, cattle and other commodities. The first coinage money is introduced in the 26th dynasty. Current officials regulated the yearly taxes and the officials main function was to ensure that the peasants paid their taxes either by persuasion or even by physical force. Taxes were not based on how much acre that had been produced that year. Remember all that Nile measuring? Surprise! Taxes were based off the result of inundation. Each year the agricultural census off officials were sent to measure the croppable area and gather a list of the institutions and private owners who held that land. This enabled them to estimate the year's crop and probable tax. Once the crops had begun to grow, other inspectors returned to make the final tax evaluation. Don't pay your taxes? Well security will swing by with switches, a type of painful stick bundle, and punish you. There were many reasons for not paying taxes. The harvest or the tax itself is stolen from you, too low of a harvest, crop spoilage, and political instability. In the late period there was also another solution to pay tax or overdue loan, which means to sell yourself for labor. And what do you know, just like nowadays, unreasonable tax led to heavy corruption, aka royal profiteering, everyone's favorite, and Egypt was full of it. In the case of the whole erecting pyramids and 30 foot self statues, if that wasn't distinctive enough. Following Hashpotet's death in 1458, Egypt's only interest was profiteering, backed by the constant threat of violence. Nothing was done to create a sustainable system of provincial government, instead a teetering hierarchy of greed, nepotistic officials and priests squabbled over positions and power. They memorialized themselves and advertised their family's greatness in corrupt expenditures much like the prodigy houses of the Elizabethan England 3000 years later. One such official was Rechmeyer, vizier to Thutmose III and his son Amenhotep II. This swaggering bigwig, who literally wore a big wig to prove his status, built himself an extravagant memorial chapel at Thebes and a monument showcasing his status, paid out of the profits of the high office. Because internal theft was endemic, a consequence of staggering inequality pervasive in Egypt at the time. Of course there's no point in judging a bronze era nation by the standards of today, but if but in Egypt the gap steadily widened as the elite abused its power. Egypt's kings and high officials happily took from other nations and even each other, and kings defaced or demolished their predecessors monuments, absorbing their achievements and sometimes even helped themselves to rationalize grave robbing. And where there is corruption, there are spoiled Nepo babies. Many, well actually most of Egypt's kings pretty much popped out of the womb and were sat on the throne. The 18th dynasty is one of the most notorious for this, fathers seemingly dropping like flies and their young sons taking over. But despite literal children taking the throne, the system of divine myths surrounding the royal line was so embedded it allowed such young kings to rule unchallenged. War profits were mostly spent on conspicuous waste, but helped create an illusion of permanence. State vanity building projects were designed to glorify the regime as part of that mirage. Amenhotep III built a sprawling palace complex on the west bank of the Nile at Thebes with courts and pylons fronted by Colossi depicting himself. At Karnak, Hashpotet erected several obelisks honoring herself and Amun, her divine father. Khufu, son of Snerfu, decided to one up his old man and commission the Great Pyramids of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world. Pepe II was only six years old when he became king of Egypt and he behaved exactly as you would expect a six year old to. An explorer told him that he had found a pygmy and he ordered the man to bring it to the palace so he could see for himself. His attitude never changed with age. He was the one who used to cover his servants in honey and make sure that the flies wouldn't bother him that way. And don't forget 
Abram sees the second, who was completely obsessed with making a name for himself, building multiple cities in his name, a museum called the Racinium, and he would even quite literally scratch out the names of previous pharaohs and write his own on their accomplishments. The guy was so childish after horribly losing the battle of Kadesh to the Hittites and barely escaping with his life and being forced to sign a peace treaty, he had a massive mural commissioned showing his miraculous triumph. Number 10 starts us with the blame game because it is super important to note off the bat, yes, because of how progressive ancient Egypt was in comparison to other societies, their grievances against women tend to align themselves with either a power play of socioeconomics or adult activities. Aside from that, property and wealth were passed through women, divorce was accessible and easy, and the concept of virginity didn't exist, so you had a lot of liberty, man or woman. Also, you weren't property as a woman, and that's like winning the ancient world's lottery card. However, one thing they had in major common with the other ancient societies is how quick they were to blame things on women. Aw oh, man, a war started because these two dudes are beefing it out over their dad's throne. Must actually be Cleopatra's fault for being so hot. Because that makes sense, alright. So if the Nile flooded, an angry goddess was to blame. If the pharaoh was killed, his wife had to be involved in the coup. Women were supposed to hold equal standing to men, but unsurprisingly, ancient Egyptian literary texts depict adulterous women as the central figures that disrupt the social order of all of Egypt and thus are deserving of a horrible death for having the audacity taint her husband, nay the world, with her evil doings. Meanwhile, a man or even a pharaoh could be playing the fields harder than a lacrosse team and nobody said boo. In one way, such stories or folktales served as warnings or regulatory mechanisms. In another, they are prime examples of symbolic violence. Women are to be blamed. The blame game is fueled by resentment, the drive of man to be the fastest, strongest, the best, yet they do not have the one truest powers their counterparts hold, a womb. The ability to create and deliver life is something their male gods can do, but the men on earth could not. If the womb wielders have built-in facet of power you can't regulate nor have yourself, chances are you're gonna be pretty mad about it and lash out in some dumb ways. Such as number nine, which is taken and takers, aka how men controlled the narrative. So in a militaristic society such as ancient Egypt, there is a hierarchy depicted in their literature and art, which Egyptian soldiers are dominant over the enemy soldiers that are subordinated. Intercourse similar to the Greeks was about pleasure, but it was also about the roles of taker and taking. Battle was also about taker and taking. Over time, these two began to correlate with the asymmetrical power relation of gender and influence how both battle and gender standards are depicted, i.e. the narratives of women, men, and war are very carefully regulated, framing gender through feminization of enemies to show them as weaklings, the taken, that the pharaoh and his men dominated as the takers. These two different hierarchies ended up legitimizing both, thus the defeat of enemies is as normal and natural as the domination of men over women. On the flip side of feminizing enemies in their murals and reliefs and statues alike, there was the absence of their enemies and even their own women. Well, at least from the New Kingdom era and onwards. Aggressive acts or depictions of slayings of the enemy's women were carefully left out of battle representations even though they were depicted earlier and were still referred to in textual sources. Clearly, local Egyptian male audiences did not find it appropriate to depict deeds against non-combatants on the walls of their temples. Another example of women's removal from history would be queens like Nefertiti, Hapshebut, Aksenamun, and countless other leading ladies that were struck out of the records by angry old men. If you want to learn more about some badass ancient Egyptian chicks and more regal ladies like them, maybe take a second to subscribe to The Hive, because we love a good historical feminist. Number eight is about life expectancy, which is determined by looking at the fractures and wear on bones. Analyses of the physical physical evidence of trauma on ancient bones, differences in skeletal markers and occupational stress, and of health status actually do indicate lower life expectancy for women than men in ancient Egypt. Now, class plays a huge role. I mean, yeah, a noble woman is definitely going to live longer than a military man foot soldier, but I'm more referring to how a woman who is physically harmed by her husband could just divorce him and walk away. But a noble woman in the same situation had to endure it due to political ties. For example, a study of 271 skeletons from the Old Kingdom cemeteries at Giza, the highest incident of bone fractures occurs in male workers at 43.75%, while bone fractures occurred in 20.73% of male high officials. Bone fractures occurred in 26.41% of female workers, but only 16.66% of the female elite. The life expectancy of women rounds down 30 years and 34 years for men. The most common killer of Egyptian women was the same as most of the ancient world. Men, disease, and of course childbirth. Women often had numerous 
numerous children and these successive pregnancies could be fatal, complications such as perpal, fever, hemorrhaging, or postpartum depression. And speaking of bones, number 7 is stick stones and broken bones. A study in 2014 comparing the bones of ancient women with those of modern female athletes has shown the average prehistoric agricultural woman had stronger upper arms than the living Cambridge University female rowing champions who are in their early 20s, train twice a day, and row an average of 120 kilometers a week. The Neolithic women analyzed in the study were from 7,400 years ago to 7,000 years ago but had similar leg bone strength to modern rowers. Their arm strength though, y'all these ladies were buff. Their bones were 11 to 16% thicker than in size than that of the rowers and almost 30% stronger. Then there were the Bronze Age ladies from 4,300 years ago to 3,500 years ago who had 9 to 13 percent stronger arm bones but their legs were 12 percent weaker. A possible explanation for these hella arm gains through generations is the tilling of soil and the harvesting of crops by hand, processing milks and meats, fetching water as well as the grinding of grain for as much as five hours a day to make flour and other things. For millennia grain would have been ground by hand between two large stones called a saddle quern. The repetitive arm action of grinding these stones together for hours may have loaded women's arms backbones in similar ways to the laborers back and forth motion of rowing. Wow, and nowadays we just doom scroll on Instagram for five hours to get buff thumbs. Dr. Jay Stocks, the senior on the study, comments our findings suggest that for thousands of years the rigorous manual labor of women was a crucial driver of the early farming economies. And speaking of, number six is the harem gals. As we know from Mike Rowe, it's a dirty job but somebody's gotta do it. The king was considered to be deserving of many women as long as he cared for his great royal wife as well. Everything that touched the person of the pharaoh was meticulously codified and ritualized as a result, starting with his closest family, his wives and their different statuses, main wives, secondary wives, favorites, and then concubines. Being in a royal harem had its ups and its downs. You were property, which is boo, but you were well taken care of, which is yay. The royal harem was installed in part of the royal palace or royal palace complex, as in Thebes or Memphis, Amenhotep III kept his concubines in a palace at Maltaka, which is one of the most opulent in the history of Egypt. Alongside these fixed harems, there were also traveling harems with a crew, so that the pharaoh's companions could follow him more comfortably during his many trips. Moreover, it was an opportunity to siphon different cities that had the honor of hosting them. Huh? Smart. Smart. You bring a band of hot ladies wherever you go, and you make a buck off of any noble trying to experience the pleasures of a different land. However, unlike the wives and other women the pharaoh pursued, these were the only ladies unable to say no. Their role is to be a temptation, and as a result of being temptations of the harem, the pharaoh could boast an abundant amount of offspring, like Ramesses II, who had no less than 85 children. And unfortunate women, as said, could die from complications or rampantly transmitted diseases. Let's be real, can't tell me crabs wasn't an issue in like 6th century BCE. Might as well segue on over to number 5 which is contraceptives and menstruation. So fun fact, that whole virginity, oh deflowering, woe is me, that crap didn't happen. Ancient Egyptians didn't even have a word for virgins, it was literally a free for all until you got married. But obviously you gotta avoid pregnancy somehow and when Aunt Flo shows up you gotta find a way to slap her right back out the door. Women who were menstruating would have been considered impure and excused from activities that had the potential to contaminate other family members. What do I mean by contaminate? They're out here acting like a period is transmittable through air. I guess they thought her essence or sweat or something would ruin the vibes of their mojo dojo casa house because ladies were even banned from cooking. Certain sections of temples would also be off limits to women at this time because we can't have them going and menstruating everywhere. Thus the tampon is born. Using a wooden splint with a softened form of papyrus they created a bundle and popped her in. And please tell me you remember the Seinfeld episode about the sponge. A famous famous contraceptive method from the 70s and 80s that was so well loved by women that when they heard it was being discontinued, they bought out all the pharmacies. Elaine in the episode herself buys the last six cases. But like Elaine and the ladies of the groovier eras, the ancient Egyptians had a similar form of contraceptive. Honey, a chia, and colocynth would be soaked in linen and then placed up in the lady parts, just like how a sponge was. Lactic acid, which is found in a chia, is a confirmed man juice aside, work with me here people. And colocynth is actually still used today in regions of the Middle East for how effective it is as a contraceptive. Another was intentionally prolonging breastfeeding. Fun fact for my uterus wielding people out there, but lactation prevents pregnancy by inhibiting ovulation. On the flip side, it's number four, how infertility sucks. In a society where intercourse outside of marriage wasn't shamed or dirty and virginity didn't even exist, it meant marriage actually really was about love, settling down, and children, considered essential for the continuation of the community. This important requisite resulted in the development of protective deities such as
Bess, Bess, and Thoris. There was also an attempt to understand and manage reproductive process. Medical formula after formula, amulet after amulet, the spiritual petition after petition, they all attested to this concern. For example, experimental marriages existed to help men avoid marrying infertile women. This test period was a year, and the experiment ended when a woman became pregnant. Then they'd get married. No pregnancy, he could stay with her if he loved her, but it would be frowned upon, knowing that a virile man could have children and still stay with her. I mean, no real downside if he leaves the girl, because you'll inevitably find someone who doesn't want kids to sweep you off your feet. And the two of you can have a dual income household filled with cats, living the ancient Egyptian dream. So, a traditional and ancient method of healing and fertility has been a pilgrimage to a shrine, where the journey as well as the offering of prayers, petitions, or in some cases following a prescribed ritual ideally will bestow or heal a woman's fertility. Through divine intervention, if a woman could not cure this, it was believed she was broken, unlikely to wed, and potentially may have spited the gods and thus should be avoided. And if it's not fertility, then your issue may require number three, which is reigniting passion. If a husband's enthusiasm for his wife had dwindled or he found himself struck with the wandering eye, he would be heavily advised to seek medical help. You hear that? You guys hear? I'll hear that. You heard it? If you're pouting that your wife isn't as hot as the other girlies, don't cheat. Go to a doctor and have them smack you upside the head. Or more accurately, give you a unique medicine elixir, which you'd give to her. Remember, it's the blame game after all. If he's not attracted to you now, suddenly it's your fault, not his. Thank God it's only the most puke inspiring concoction imaginable, made up of dandruff from the scalp of a killed person, blood from a black dog's tick, a drop of your husband's blood from his left ring finger, and his uh, man juice. No specification, but still had to be fresh or if he had to bring it to the doctor in a little cup. If the wife drank this elixir, it was said the husband should fall back in love. Pretty sure she had to love him a lot to drink that nasty crap and not just get one of those quickie ancient Egypt divorces. If the problem was he couldn't get it up, well, there's a 90% less disgusting hack for that that the doctors would hand over. A mix of powder to chia seeds and honey that he should rub all over down there. Doesn't work. Next option is foam from a stallion's mouth, so that first option better work. Number two, they're professional drama queens. Death and birth were big deals in ancient Egypt. If families could afford it, they'd get real elaborate with funerals. Hell, if someone was getting sick, it was tradition for everybody to start putting money aside, which is kind of evil if you think about it, but it would make everyone very comfortable with the concept of death to have it thrown at you this way. So, I mean, whatever works. Individuals would be carefully mummified by professional embalmers. The body was often decked out in ambulance and jewelry installed in a fine sarcophagus before being interned in a tomb. High class people might even have mortuary temples where priests would offer prayers and goods to sustain the dead person's soul. And some lady you've never seen before who throws herself on the sarcophagus, screaming her damn lungs out while everyone pretends she isn't there and nothing weird is going on. According to the funerary art of ancient Egypt, one of the most striking traditions is that of a professional mourner. These women were paid to act out extravagant grief. In some paintings, they appear weeping and disheveled while touching the deceased's coffin dramatically. Some stories depict them rolling on the ground. Sometimes if a real rich dude died, ladies showed up topless and beset an Anubis mask. Crap could get real crazy. I'd say it wasn't a messed up thing that happened to the ladies, but it definitely was one of the messed up things they did. Don't get it twisted though. I definitely want a professional mourner at my funeral. Last but not least, number one is buried alive. Ah, life of a concubine. As mentioned, crap ain't glamorous physically, but it's at least mentally stimulating. You know what isn't? Being buried alive in a tomb and having to wait out your demise or from starvation or hunger or a deadly snake bite. Who knows? This was very real reality of the concubines and servants until the ancient Egyptians realized maybe it wasn't functional to dispose of an entirely highly trained staff of the previous emperor when they can dutifully serve the next one. So why did the early pharaohs do this? Flaunt some power. Feel a god complex. The belief was that what belonged to the pharaoh on earth also belonged to him in the afterlife. This didn't include material possessions, but people too, like servants and his concubines. This belief enabled the pharaoh to enjoy the same lifestyle in the underworld as he did in the living world. It just meant burying some people alive. The earliest cases date from the late Egyptian prehistory in the reign of Nakata II, when e Egyptologists discovered decapitated bodies found in several cemeteries. King Dejet's tomb had 318 sacrifices with him, but altogether the estimates appear to be much higher, with a possible 580, 20% of which are women. Why did the practice of the retainer sacrifices stop after the first dynasty? There's no easy answer. As said, it's illogical to dispose of people that way, especially artisans and women that they needed. So they brought in the cute little Shapti dolls to take that role, and these ladies and servants alike got to continue breathing breaths of fresh air. We're gonna start with the latest and the greatest. Number 10 is the latest Saqqara discoveries. So on January 26th of 2023, after a year-long excavation of the notorious Saqqara necropolis, two ancient tombs that date back to the 5th and 6th dynasty of the Old Kingdom are unveiled to the 
public. Zahi Hawass, who isn't my favorite person to cite, gave a statement on one of the mummies found. Kanahe de Defe was a inspector of officials, supervisor of nobles, and a priest in the pyramid complex of Unas. Mehdi had many titles, one of them being the Keeper of Secrets, which is a title you'll hear again later in this video. This would also be a great time to take a second and subscribe to The Hive if you're a fan of discoveries such as these. Also found was a stone sarcophagus with a mummified man named Fatek, but the most important of the dusty corpses found was a gold leaf covered mummy. Hekeshepis was found down a 15 meter burial shaft inside a large rectangular limestone sarcophagus. While other mummies have been found with this unusual coding choice, Hekeshepis gets to take seniority. This mummy is the oldest complete mummy covered in gold, Hawass said in an interview having led the excavation himself. The excavation team also found dozens of other valuable artifacts including statues, some of which still have their original paint intact, as well as amulets, coins, earrings, rings, and tablets, all of which are currently being displayed at the Step Pyramid of Hauser in Saqqara. Number 9 is the Tomb Special of Collecting Crocs. Archaeologists excavating the Theban necropolis in Egypt made an extraordinary but unusual discovery which was announced on December 20th of 2022. Nine crocodile heads placed inside two tombs belonging to high ranking nobles. Archaeologist Patrick Chudzik told the Newsweek that the discovery was the first of its kind as crocodile remains have never been discovered inside the tombs of Egypt despite usually being found inside of temples or special catacombs. Dr. Chudzik explains in our case things are different. Firstly, only the heads and not the entire bodies of these Nile reptiles have been, have been deposited in these tombs where we work. Secondly, they were not mummified, only wrapped in linen. There is a significant difference in this as no preservatives were used. Finally, the remains were found in the tombs of humans, not catacombs of sacred animals. The tombs belong to two top officials during the reign of the pharaoh Nehefetre, Mentohalpet II. One being the Chancellor Cheti, a high official, but the occupant of the second tomb is actually still anonymous to us. Placing of the crocodile heads in the tombs, according to Dr. Chudzik, certainly was unusual, but not entirely unprecedented. He believes that earlier researchers paid scant attention to such finds that depict cultural practices, but weren't treasures, stating that it's likely similar offerings had been placed in quite a few other tombs of rich individuals, but those offerings were discarded by the earlier researchers who discovered them. Number 8 is about the Ramesid Cemetery. So in April of 2023, the joint Dutch-Italian archaeological mission of the Saqqara archaeological site discovered the tomb of a person called Banhishia from the Ramesid period, the chief servant of the tomb of a ten. Alongside his tomb was the discovery of four small chapels, reinforcing the previous theories that suggest the reuse of the space between the tombs of the 18th dynasty in later eras and the constructions of tombs and chapels in that area during the Ramesid period of Egypt. The cemetery is a self-contained temple, having its own entrance and inner courtyard as well as an underground burial chamber. Oddly, out of two out of those four chapels I mentioned were in dedication of a person that they don't recognize called Yo-Yo. Endless inscriptions and scenes on the walls are distinguished by their accuracy and quality of detail. One in particular shows a scene of funerary procession of Yo-Yo and the process of reviving his mummy again in the hereafter to live in the afterlife as a god, in addition to a scene depicting the cow goddess Hathor and a boat of the god Sekera, the god of the underworld. Inside the tomb, the mission found a Stella picturing of Banhasi and his wife Baya, the singer of Amun, before a table of sacrifice and several drawings of priests and animals. While some have warriors, others have the terracotta inscriptions, which is number 7. The Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and, Equi and Antiquities announced another discovery in Saqqara, March 17th, 2022. As the title of the video reveals, it's very obviously tombs, specifically 5 of them. All burials date to either Old Kingdom or the first transition slash intermediate period, roughly 4,700 to 4,000 years ago. All belong to top officials and dignitaries from respective time periods and are in good state of preservation. Eity, one of the top nobles of the court, had a well-defined pathway leading to his burial room with the walls adorned with engraved pictures of many funeral scenes painted in bright terracotta and sandstones. Artistically, the colors of the paintings are considered royal colors by officials. Grave number two belonged to the wife of a man named Yart. Meanwhile, grave number three belonged to a person named Bobby Farahafe, who used to occupy several important court positions, namely supervisor of the Great House, the Chanting 
Christian priest and the cleaner of the house. The fifth cemetery is a man called Hanu, who had many titles such as the mayor. And the sixth grave, however, is the most interesting of them as it has the archaeologist a little giddy. A woman called Betty, who is responsible for the king's makeup, appearance, and dressing, and was buried with tons of her cosmetic tools. Allegedly, she is also a priestess of Hathor, who's the goddess of love, beauty, music, fertility, and pleasure. You want to hear something crazy? Number six is how they cracked open a tomb and found a hundred sealed coffins. It was announced on the 14th of November 2020. It's the largest find of that year. It's a hundred sealed coffins and over 40 statues alongside hundreds of mixed artifacts. Naturally, they're discovered at the Saqqara necropolis and carbon dating tells us that the items date back to the Ptolematic dynasty that ruled Egypt for some 300 years from about 320 BC to 30 BC and the late period. The coffins were found inside a burial shaft that had not been opened at all for 2,500 years. The preliminary studies revealed quickly that most of these coffins belonged to 26 dynasty priests, top officials, and elites. A number of wooden statues and colored gilded masks were also found, all in really great condition. And 28 of the statuettes are Pate Sokar, the main god of the Saqqara necropolis. But there's one very special and unusual statue in this tomb, a bronze statue of the god Nefreta. The statue is inlaid with valuable precious stones. We're talking red agate, turquoise, jade, and lupus lazuli. It is 35 centimeters tall and has the name of its owner, Badia Munis, engraved in its base like Andy in Toy Story. I mentioned telling y'all about another keeper, the secret, so that's exactly what number five will be. This impressive tomb complex belonged to Kedes, a priest and official who was once the most powerful in Egypt. Egypt, aside from the pharaoh, of course. It was found during an excavation of an unfinished pyramid that's adjacent to two extensive necropolises, but the identity of the builder or even the name of the unfinished site is still unknown. On a mission to gain that information, the Czech team were working on the site for only two weeks when they made their remarkable and unexpected discovery. The burial complex contains a tomb but also a series of other rooms, and one held a cult chapel which serves as a magnificent example of Old Kingdom architecture. In the tomb room, however, there's a limestone Coffin and a statue of Kedes, which has been somewhat miraculously preserved in its original location, according to the Czech Institute of Egyptology's report. It even still had some of its original paint. So, the statue is also a source of context in the tomb, revealing the name of Kedes and his many titles for us. Based on the inscriptions from the tomb, he was also the sole friend of the pharaoh. This tomb has provided experts with many new insights on the Fifth Dynasty era. The discovery of the statue in the tomb was dramatic, as it proved an old kingdom at least. They did place statues of the dead in their own tombs. Sadly, this is one of those times where grave goods were looted centuries ago, so not much else remains. For number four, we'll learn about ancient Photoshop. Thanks to new x-ray scanning methods, as announced July 13th of 2022, we now know that some of the pharaoh's paintings have been subtly edited over time. Traditionally, the analysis of ancient Egyptian paintings has been conducted in controlled laboratory environments or museum premises. This new study has instead pioneered a groundbreaking approach. Instead of taking the painting to the lab, bring the lab to the painting. You preserve history, you aren't stealing crap you shouldn't, and nobody gets cursed for tampering. I see nothing but wins here. So the findings focused on two paintings from the Ramesside period, which were discovered in tomb chapels located near the Thebian necropolis. Through the application of x-ray technology, the team scanned specifically a painting of Ramesses II, unveiling hidden details imperceivable to the naked eye. Previously, scholars speculated the painting depicted the pharaoh grieving the loss of his father. However, the latest scan of the portrait challenges the interpretation is Ramesses can be seen beneath a cult canopy before the enthroned Ptah. Additionally, there's adjustments to the crown and other royal items in the portrait of Ramesses II. And he's currently depicted wearing a Wexit collar, which was not historically used during his reign. Underneath that new layer of paint is the original painting of a Shebu collar. These modifications likely reflect shifts in the symbolic significance of these elements over time. This finding suggests that ancient Egyptians continuously adapted their artistic expressions to convey evolving cultural and religious ideologies even when pharaohs had passed. This next tomb is a bit more recent and a bit more strange. Number three is Pet Cemetery. May 28th of 2023 marked the completion of the sixth excavation season in the Saqqara. They had announced their latest finding, two humans and an animal embalming workshop, as well as two tombs of notable officials and their wives, all conjoined together. According to the press release from the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, the structures date back to the 30th pharaonic dynasty to 
the Ptolematic period around 2400 years ago. The newest discovered animal embalming workshop was constructed with mud and limestone floors. A number of the rooms and halls were found to contain a large number of pottery, linen, animal embroidery, and different animal burials. Researchers found one room stockpiled with bronze tools used specifically for animal mummification processes, and varying sizes of stone beds used to mummify the most sacred of animals. And then they found the similar room but for humans. So large stone beds ended in gutters to facilitate the mummification process with the collection of clay pots nearby to hold entrails and organs, as well as a collection of instruments and ritual vessels. Analysis later determined that the chemical residues discovered in these tombs were a mixture of fragrant or antiseptic oils, tars, and resins, according to the ministry. When all of these paints and resins are brought together, including the damar tree resin and the enmi oil, the researchers figured out quite unusually that the raw materials were imported from Asia and other regions of Africa. How did we manage to find a queen we didn't know we lost, but we're still out searching for Nefertiti and Cleopatra? Irony of life. Number two is unearthed but unknown. What are the chances that are in the 100 year anniversary of unearthing King Tut's tomb, archaeologists discovered hundreds of tombs and mummies buried in Giza. This genuinely happened on November 4th of 2022, and even crazier, it's attached to a pyramid of a never before known ancient Egyptian queen. So, to quote Zahi Hawass, most burials known in the Saqqara previously were either from the Old Kingdom or Late Period. Now we have 22 interconnected shafts ranging 30 to 60 feet, all with New Kingdom burials, aka this is an unusual but incredible find. Buried within these shafts, archaeologists found huge limestone sarcophagus alongside 300 beautiful coffins, Hawass said. The coffins have individual faces, each one unique, distinguishing between men and women, and are decorated with scenes from the Book of the Dead. Each coffin also has the name of the deceased and often shows the four sons of Horus who protected the organs of the deceased. This shows that mummification reached its peak in the New Kingdom, still quoting Hawass. Some coffins have two lids and most amazing coffins so far had the mask of a woman made completely of solid gold. In addition, they found a pyramid commemorating a previously unknown queen. We have since discovered that her name was Neith and she had never before been known from historical record. It is amazing to literally rewrite what we know of history, adding a new queen to our records. While much of the life of the real queen Neith still remains unknown, the discovery of her pyramid is likely to provide significant insight into her role. This tomb's discovery was far grander than that of Tut's, yet war overshadowed its discovery, making it back page news. Well today it gets its rightful attention as number one, it's the silver pharaoh. To start some context, in ancient Egyptian culture gold was considered the flesh of the gods, while silver was believed to be their bones. Gold was abundant in ancient Egypt, making silver more valuable as it had to be imported from western Asia and the Mediterranean. Ok, now story time. So amidst the chaos of the second world war in western Europe, a French archaeologist found the world's most fabulous tomb. At the world's worst time, as said, the discovery is largely overshadowed despite its magnitude, somewhat understandably as European societies preoccupied with escalating conflict. What amped the magnitude of this find was that the pharaoh was entombed in a solid silver coffin, a massive testament to immense wealth and power that we've never seen in another Egyptian tomb since. Bonus points for the silver anthropod coffin being found in a pink granite coffin, which in turn was encased within a plain granite sarcophagus. Unlike Tut's body, however, Montet only ever found a pile of bones, black dust, and funerary items like the gold mummy board and a spectacular gold mask that would have covered the pharaoh's face and given Tut's a run for his mummy. Ha, <laughs> get it? This loss sadly was from groundwater seeping in through to the mummy and most of the wooden items entombed also deteriorated over time. Nonetheless, Montet was able to recover several non-perishable items such as canopic jars and shabatis, along with precious objects inside the sarcophagus, treasures that rival Tut's in their worth. When considering the wealth of the objects found in Susinna's tomb along with the duration of his reign, it appears that a reassessment of the situation in Egypt during the third intermediate period, or at least during the reign of Sunese, the silver pharaoh, is long overdue. Kicking off our list at number 10, the Dendera Light. Here we go, going back to ancient aliens, maybe, who knows. The Dendera Light is a controversial image found in the Temple of Hadar in Dendera, Egypt. Now, some theories suggest that this image here depicts an ancient Egyptian light bulb or some advanced electrical technology of some sorts, which is pretty exciting. However, mainstream Egyptologists interpret it as a symbolic representation of religious concepts. That makes more sense than ancient Egyptian light brights, I guess. I guess it's not as fun, but 
Sure, checks out. The bulb is more likely a depiction of the lotus flower, and the central figure holding a snake is associated with the creation myths. So, yeah, there's some history there. There's some tea behind. There's some stuff you have to know. The Dendera light is a subject of debate and speculation to this day, of course, because people want to believe that this is aliens, an alien light show. But there's currently no concrete evidence to support the claim that this represents ancient Egyptian knowledge of electricity or advanced lighting technology of sorts. Again, part of me wants to believe in ancient light bulbs, but maybe I've been playing too much Zelda. That's probably it. That's probably that, maybe. I don't know. Number nine, beer. Yeah, that's some pretty good stuff coming up next. Ancient Egyptians, they brewed and consumed beer on a daily basis. Now, they considered it a staple of their diet. Cool, me too, I guess. Beer production was primarily a household activity with everybody in the family helping the process, which is great. That's, what does your family taste like? Let's do it. The brewing techniques here involved fermenting grains, barley, and flavoring the beer with dates, honey, and spices, and pretty much anything you wanted. It's your brew. Get creative, throw, throw random shit in there, see how it tastes. Why not? It's ancient Egypt. Beer had both religious and social significance. Beer would be offered to deities and consumed during festivals and gatherings. Give a, a deity a Coors Light, you're like, here you go. This ought to cool you down. Rocky Mountain certified, buddy. Stop yelling, stop cursing our lands. It also provided hydration, nutrition, and a means of socializing in ancient Egyptian society. So, hard to say no to that. Twist my arm, please. Number eight, curses. Of course, these are, these are real, these are very real. And you'll get cursed if you don't hit that thumbs up. Ancient Egyptian curses are a subject of fascination and speculation, of course. Curses were believed to be supernatural powers wielded by priests or individuals to protect sacred sites and or tombs from desecration. These curses often warned of dire consequences for anyone who disturbed the resting place of a pharaoh or violated these sacred spaces at all. The curses were typically inscribed on tomb walls or objects and invoked the wrath of gods and spirits. Ergo, don't touch my sh Thanks. Many inscriptions contain symbolic threats rather than the direct supernatural actions. So the curse of the pharaohs is mainly associated with King Tut. This curse gained attention when several individuals involved in the excavation of Tut's tomb just died unexpectedly. However, these deaths can be attributed to natural causes or coincidences, of course. But the timing here was a little, it's a little cursed. Nobody really knows, right? We wanna believe. Maybe it's fun to believe. That way we won't steal things from the dead, right? Let's go that way. Number seven, a pet hippo. Are you a dog person? Are you a cat person? How about hippos? They're fun. They'll maybe eat you, who knows? Real quick, do you have any idea how fast hippos are? I had no clue my entire life. I thought they were fat and fun and stationary. No, hippos can run as fast as 50 kilometers an hour. Their bite is three times as powerful as the bite of a lion's. Yeah, so you shouldn't fuck with them. You shouldn't fuck with them with the pH. <laughs> the pharaoh Menes was Egypt's first pharaoh. We refer to him as the lost pharaoh because, well, for starters, he was alive a very long time ago, 3000 BC, don't know much about him, but also he was killed by his pet hippo, therefore definitely lost. We lost him fast, fast and loud. This king spent over 60 years on the throne, and after all of that, all the wars and conquests and all the treaties, after all that, a hippo got him. What a shame. I mean, to be fair, I don't think there's a harder way to go out as a king. A hippo killed you? I don't know. That's pretty badass. That's like top three coolest ways to die next to like the Megalodon. I don't know. Number six, Israel Sphinx Claws. Ah, here we go. Some ancient Wolverine stuff coming in here. The mystery of the Sphinx Claws in Israel. This refers to a set of large limestone claws that were of course discovered near the city of Tel Hazor. Now these claws resemble feline paws of some sort. They're very sharp, very large, very intimidating, and they're believed to have once been part of a Sphinx sculpture. So if someone just took a little bit home with them, that's always nice. The origin and purpose of these claws of course remain uncertain. Now some theories suggest that they were brought from Egypt or represent the influence of Egyptian culture in the region. One of the two. Someone stole it or someone was inspired. One of the two. Others propose alternative explanations such as symbolic or decorative elements. However, without further evidence or historical context, we don't really know because this was, I don't know, 3,000 years ago? Where do these hands come from? They're scary, but we'll never know. It is fascinating. I just wanted to show you these cool hands. Number five. Fake beard. I need one of these, cause uh, yeah, I tried recently and I disappeared off the channel. I was too, I was too ashamed to come back. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a 
pharaoh. This is pretty impressive. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male, as a male pharaoh. So the pharaoh fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was done as an act of politics. Now after her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name. He, yeah, just script, back then it wasn't, you know, hard to just, you break one thing and then everything's gone. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this idiot being like, hey, fake beards, look at that, you missed one. Number four, game night. I love board games, even Monopoly, believe it or not. I have the patience for it every now and then. But ancient Egyptians, they also fancied a board game, turns out, who knew? Dogs and Jackals, Mahen, Senate, and 20 Squares. These were all popular go-to games for their ancient Egyptian cottage weekends. Mahen was played around 2500 BC, and the goal was to reach the center of the spiral first. The board was a coiled snake almost. It was quite beautiful. Senate was the most popular game. Queens and kings alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Now, of course, the rules are still unknown and heavily debated, just like Monopoly. But you had three rows of 10 squares. The last five squares are decorated, so it's assumed that this game was themed on the afterlife. Plus, King Tut was buried with one of these game boards. There's something very Jumanji about this that I want to know more of, but I also don't want to know more of. Why was he buried with a board game? That's kind of terrifying. There's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing a board game of sorts. Yeah, it kind of looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. My palms would be so sweaty. I'd be like, checkmate, please don't exile me. Thanks so much. Let's play again sometime. Peace. Number three, the first peace treaty. Bizarre at the time? Absolutely. Definitely. This is a first. The first peace treaty in history was back in 1271 BC. Now at this point in time, Egyptians and the Hittite Empire, they were fighting over modern day Syria. Now this conflict had been lasting centuries and come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was now underway. At this point, there's tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. So what's left to do at this point? A peace treaty, right? Hopefully, ideally, Ramses II and King Hadassuli III Third, both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if a third party decided to now get involved. A copy of the treaty can be found in New York right above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. Pretty impressive. I have a license plate above my room, so that's almost as cool, I guess. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty, so that's how you know it's official. Guinness confirms it. Moving on. Number two, renewed passport. Now I'm thinking about where my passport is and I'm immediately panicking. I'm like, oh, which shelf? Ooh. Before a big bad haunting number one, we'll do a fun one with some recent history. This is cheeky. Passports are important and they're a pain to replace. But did you know that you can still get one even if you've been dead for thousands of years? Well, now you do. You just have to be a pharaoh though. That's the only rule. You have to be a pharaoh or some sort of king. Pharaoh Ramses II, we just talked about him, one of ancient Egypt's greatest rulers. He got a passport back in 1974. Insane, the same time my grandma did probably. After being exhumed and put on display for so long, it was decided that it's now time to send this lost king off to Paris to get touched up. Now, obviously, you're not going to list this pharaoh king as luggage. That would be super disrespectful. So the Egyptian government gave Ramses II his own official Egyptian passport for his commute with a photo. Just in case you didn't know. On the passport, he had his info. It's all great. He has age, very old, occupation, a king. And in case it wasn't obvious, it was stated that the king was deceased. Looking at him, you're like, oh, yeah, certainly. Yeah, go on in. Definitely dead. For sure dead. Don't even have to look twice. We're good. And finally, number one, trusty servant. In ancient Egypt, it was common for servants to accompany their masters into the afterlife. Whenever they go, now you have to go. Horrible, right? This practice reflected the belief that individuals needed assistance and companionship even in the realm of the dead. Hashtag needy. Servants were considered essential for ensuring the comfort and well-being of the deceased here and again in the afterlife, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but again, long time ago, different beliefs. They would be depicted in tomb paintings and inscriptions, and their statues or figurines would be placed in these tombs to then serve the deceased. These servants were believed to continue their duties in the afterlife, providing sustenance, performing daily tasks, and maintaining the deceased social status. Like, when does it end, guy? Like, f come on. The inclusion the inclusion of servants and burial rituals exemplifies the importance of social hierarchy and the idea of continuity in ancient Egyptian culture. So while it's crazy to us, it's, well, it's very important then. 
It's quite important now. Fucking crazy, but it's still pretty important. Okay, so let's talk about horrible hygiene. Maybe an over exaggeration, but hygiene of any kind was better than whatever the hell they were trying to accomplish in Europe without showering. At least the people of ancient Egypt considered it an important enough cultural value that they'd wash once a day. Even if it meant they also shaved their head, crunched down beetles for makeup, and rubbed dung on their acne. 2,000 years before Hesse Ray was credited for being the world's first dentist, the Egyptians were making their own toothbrush by fraying the ends of twigs. The toothpaste used was a powder like that vegan one at Lush that makes you feel like you're chewing on chalk. It was made of ox hooves, burnt eggshells, and pumice. Mmm, kiss me good morning after you rub that on your teeth with your dental twig, babe. Speaking of, for those whose breath smelled as bad as the armpits of the lower class Egyptians, also had numerous mouthwashes. Some had to be chewed up and spat out like bran or celery. Honey was combined with boiled herbs and spices, such as cinnamon and myrrh, to form a dehydrated pellet, which they also used as breath mints. And speaking of armpit, the the Egyptians had a deodorant body rub made of ostrich egg, turtle shell, and roasted tamarisk. Nothing like waking up bright and early for a day of building pyramids and the first thing you have to do is some casual Harry Potter potion making just to not smell like camel crap. Speaking of hygiene, your clothes were never clean. So even if your body was haha germaphobe, you still aren't safe. In the later periods of ancient Egyptian history, people began wearing clothes made of linen, not hides, cottons, furs, and rendered leathers like they used to. Linen was light and flexible so it was good for the hot Egyptian climate. However, linen was white, meaning the clothes showed dirt very easily, an issue they hadn't really had to deal with before. But most materials they'd worn didn't hold up well under water like linen did, so the ancient Egyptians started doing laundry more often to get rid of the dirt. But they washed their clothes in the Nile, where people also relieved themselves, and dumped garbage, and human bodies. So uh, this meant that the Egyptians washed their clothes in water filled with parasites and bacteria. Even if drying it in the sun baked most of that away, you then still had the world's chafing. Linen. To learn who did the laundry, the labor, the provision, and the caretaking, let's discuss family values. You may as well pop a little white picket fence up around the pyramids, guys, because nobody idealized the nuclear family quite like the ancient Egyptians, who held it at the core of their society. There was a tremendous pride in one's family, and lineage was traced through both the mother's and the father's lines. Everyone, even the gods and goddesses, were married. While premarital relations or any romps between unmarried people were socially acceptable, an unmarried man was was seen as incomplete, and schoolboys were advised to wed early and father as many children as possible. Once married, however, couples were expected to be sensually faithful to each other. Egyptians, with exception to the king, were in theory monogamous, and many records indicate the couples expressed true affection for each other. Although the institution of marriage was taken seriously, if you don't end up working out with the person you married at 15, shocker, divorce was not uncommon, let alone remarrying, so at least that was one little less impossible thing. Until marriage, following their parents' footsteps, steps, boys were trained in the trades and professions by their fathers and uncles, while girls stayed at home to learn from their mothers. In their early adult years, girls would marry, move from home, and the cycle would start again. Would start again with the dreaded childbirth. Egypt had the highest birth rate in the ancient world, and yet things were far from perfect. Although the Egyptians understood the general functions of parts of the reproductive system, the relationship between said parts were sometimes unclear to them. Like the origin of a man's love potion, since it was white, is from his bones because those are also white, and nothing else was. Logic, eh? Most married women spent most of their lives either pregnant or breastfeeding. With little medical advice available, amulets and charms bearing figures of the pregnant hippopotamus goddess Tarawet, and the mini demigoddess Bess were often used to protect both the mother and her unborn child, as children of all sexes were valued and desired. The mother prepared for birth by removing her clothing, loosening her hair, or just snatching her wig off. They did wear wigs. The birth of the child was a great joy, as well as a serious concern given the high mortality rate and stress of childbirth on a mother. So, a midwife was an important career in Egypt. The everyday mothers squatted on birthing bricks for delivery, wealthy households had specially constructed huts or pools, and the midwife used a sharp obsidian or flint knife to cut the umbilical cord. The midwife was also on standby to try and help in any troubling birth situations that may arise. After childbirth, you breastfed for how long? Next one is latch off already. One of the best ways to maintain a healthy infant under the less than sanitary conditions that prevailed in ancient times was by breastfeeding. In addition to transfer of antibodies through mother's milk, breastfeeding also offered protection from foodborne diseases. If your kid isn't exposed to potentially contaminated food at the time when their immune system is at its weakest, they're inherently going to survive longer. Way of the jungle, y'all. It's why we don't feed babies chicken. Indirect evidence for this occurring in ancient Egypt actually came to us from a number of cemeteries where young adults and unders death rates peaked at times that correlated with the introduction
reduction to solid foods in their body. Prolonged lactation also offered a number of health advantages to you as the mother. Primarily, it reduces the chances of conceiving another child too soon by hormonally suppressing ovulation, which allows the mother more enjoyable stress-free times with her husband between pregnancies. So, how long is prolonged? A minimum of a three-year period for suckling was recommended in the instructions of any from the New Kingdom, and therefore struck an honestly unconscious but evolutionary important balance between the needs of procreation, the health of a mother, and the survival of a child. But don't worry son, as long as you live, dad's gonna pick your career. Young men didn't get jack bleep in the way of choosing what they wanted from the day their little man got snipped. They were harassed about marriage by their mom incessantly, and dad's always yelling at them for not holding the Dandera flashlight in the right spot so he could see more properly. This is because once a man is viable for marriage, he needs to be prepared to support his partner. A father's role became about teaching his son's living skill. Herodotus and Diodorus often refer to a hereditary calling in ancient Egypt. Not a system of rigid inheritance of a career, but an endeavor to pass on the father's function to his children. If dad teaches you glass blowing primarily, but also woodwork and butchering, then you're going to start as a glass blower and use your time outside of it to learn and integrate into the trade you prefer more. Maybe it was butchering or woodwork, but maybe it was something different altogether. A son was commonly referred to as the staff of his father's old age. By mastering his father's trade before one of his own, at insured as dad ages, son can take care of the family business if it's more lucrative and supports his father better that way. By the way, for this reason, adoption was huge in Egypt. And once you're an adult with a family to support, you'll learn how currency was nightmarish. Up until the time of the Persian invasion in 525 BCE, the Egyptian economy operated on a barter system based on agriculture. The monetary unit of ancient Egypt was the Deben, and it was approximately 90 grams of copper. Expensive items could also be priced in Deben. So, like if a 75 liters of wheat cost one Deben, and then a pair of sandals also cost one Deben, it made perfect sense to the Egyptians that a pair of sandals could be purchased with a bag of wheat as easily as a chunk of copper. Even if the sandal maker had more than enough wheat, she would happily accept it in payment because it could be easily bartered in exchange for something else somewhere else. The most common item used to make purchases were wheat, barley, and cooking or lamp oil, but in theory almost anything would do. Beer was the most popular drink in ancient Egypt and was frequently used as compensation. The lower class of society produced the most goods used in trade and therefore provided the means for the entire culture to thrive. Even if it did mean going to the market required bringing just as many bags of things with you as you were going to leave with. And since I mentioned beer, life in Egypt would be impossible unless you liked liquor. Wages were paid primarily in grain. Thanks weird Egyptian currency system, just what I wanted to bring home after a 10 hour labor shift. A 6 pound bag of barley, which was then used to make the two staples of the Egyptian diet. Bread and beer. Beer was made from barley dough, so bread making and beer making happened simultaneously. Egyptians made a variety of beers of different strengths, which was calculated according to how many standard measures of liquid was made from one hecate of barley. Thus, beer of strength 2 was stronger than beer of strength 10. These divisions were made because there was no 100% clean drinking water, so everybody of all ages drank beer all the time. And what's beer cause? Bloating, weight gain, heartburn, liver issues, and if you're predisposed to any of these things and you have to spend your life drinking beer, make sure not to jump up and down, you're probably going to combust. But don't worry, if the beer has you feeling like crap, you definitely had access to laxatives 24-7. An investigation by the UK's University of Manchester and the Egyptian Medicinal Plant Conservation Project provided findings that laxatives were an accessible and normally product by ancient Egyptians. Doctors in ancient Egypt believed the human body should be regularly flushed out to prevent disease and clean the intestines, not just in times of illness. Many Egyptians took this advice and used castor oil to force waste out of their body. Figs, bran, and dates were also used as laxatives in ancient Egypt, and one ancient remedy to relieve excess gas and indigestion was cumin, a hefty portion of goose fat, and milk, boiled together, strained, consumed. Metcalf, a scientist in the Manchester University School of Medicine, adds that the Egyptian use of bowel stimulants such as the bitter fruit coxin and castor oil remained in clinical use until about 40 years ago, so the amount of crapping would have definitely made living in ancient Egypt crappy. And naturally, what's worse than being terrified to leave? Like the people of Mesopotamia, 
India, China, and Greece. Ancient Egyptians lived in modest homes and apartments, raised families, and enjoyed their leisure time. A significant difference, however, is between Egyptian culture and that of other lands was that the Egyptians believed their land was intimately tied to their personal salvation, so they had a deep fear of dying beyond the borders of Egypt. It was thought that the fertile dark earth of the Nile River Delta was the only area sanctified by the gods for the rebirth of the soul in the afterlife, and to be buried anywhere else would be to be condemned to non-existence. Those who served their country in arms are those who traveled for a living, saved money, and made provisions for their bodies to be returned to Egypt should they be killed. However, due to this belief, as we know Egyptians were not amongst the world's great travelers. There is no Egyptian Herodotus, Alvia Chalabi. Even in negotiations and treaties with other countries, Egyptian preference for remaining in Egypt ensured everyone had to come to them. Even within the confines of the country, people did not travel far from their places of birth, and most, except for times of war, famine, or upheaval, lived their lives and died in the same locale. It's believed that one's afterlife would be a continuation of one's presence. The yard and tree and stream you saw every day outside your window would replicate your afterlife exactly. So Egyptians were encouraged to live gratefully within their means and care for their environment and never leave. We're gonna start with peace treaties. Egyptologists know Ramses II as the pharaoh who restored Egypt's relations with Syria and built a lot of neat temples in the desert back in the 1200s BC. And he's the one in that Disney movie whose first son gets smoked by the plague. Kind of a wild guy, so we'll talk about him quite a bit in this vid. Anyways, for over two centuries, the Egyptians fought against the Hittite Empire for control of lands in modern day Syria. The conflict gave rise to a bloody boot down, such as the 1247 BC Battle of Kadesh. But by the time of the Pharaoh Ramesses II, neither side had emerged as a clear victor, and this was just becoming all drawn out and bloody and just plain stupid, especially with both empires facing threats from people outside each other. But who's ever gonna be the first to wave the white flag, let's be real, when it comes to two dudes? Y'all are notoriously known for just beating each other up, shaking hands, and best friends again. So in 1259 BC, the two said, ah, to hell with it, let's do lunch, and Ramses II and the Hittite king Hatsu Sili III negotiated a famous peace treaty, one that was either the first known in creation or one of the earliest ever. This agreement ended the conflict and decreed the two kingdoms would aid each other in the event of an invasion by a third party. This treaty is now recognized as one of the earliest surviving peace accords and a copy can be seen above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council. How about some ancient Egyptian body dysmorphia because bodies are supposed to look like this, right? That's what Akhenaten was probably wondering and it must have been awkward as hell for fine as so Queen Nefertiti and normal looking son King Tut to try and lie their way through any reply to that. Because this whack job was known for two things. Firstly, as who forced monotheism on Egypt so brutally that when he died his son had to awkwardly erase his legacy. And secondly, he was one funny looking dude. He had an hourglass figure like a BBL baddie, an elongated head with a square jaw jutting out, big curved almond eyes, and let's say he could have filled out a bra better than me. So, Egyptians like to play Photoshop with their selfies the way we do now, and the first depictions of Ak, his body and head are normal. But after he forced monotheism, that literally destroyed the economy and empire, his gender in sculptures and carvings became became more ambiguous. Three explanations. First, he's the most hated pharaoh in history. So I mean, come on, artistic license, get some anger out. Second, perhaps his changing appearance was metaphorical, meant to portray Ak as the father and mother of all humankind. Third, is that it was a genetic disorder, such as amitrace excess syndrome, where the body released equal levels of both hormones. But we all know what the likely one was, seeing as these guys could quite literally not keep their hands or really any appendage out of their family members. I'm not gonna lie, I can't handle having eyeliner on for three hours that me and my roommate go out. Meanwhile, the pharaohs had obligatory face beat like they were working at ancient Sephora every day. Early Greek traders who visited Egypt were astonished by the sophistication and precision with which Egyptians took care of their skin and hair and decorated their bodies. Europeans remarked that almost everyone was wearing makeup even in public places and that'd be accurate as both men and women were known to wear copious amounts of the stuff, believing it gave them the protection of the gods Horus and Ra who were always fighting or banging each other and doing so in a full face of makeup like some spectacular fursuit wearing drag queens. The only distinguishing factor between men and women's makeup was that men's makeup was simple while women's was often heavier and more complex. The distinguishing factor of all makeup, however, was wealth. Nobles could afford the fresher or less diluted products, while lower status had to use makeup from poorer quality materials, which sucks since they worked in the sun all day, and higher quality coal you lined your eyes with, the better it reduced sun reflection. This act will also protect them from evil spirits and eye diseases, as they believe their makeup had magical hearing powers, and they weren't entirely wrong. Research has shown that lead-based cosmetics worn along the Nile actually staved off eye infections. All right, you annoying ancient astronaut people, this is for you, Tut's space knife. I am not sitting here doing the work for y'all, pretending we all don't know who 
King Tut is. He was the child pharaoh, smoked by a hippo bite, cursed tomb, blah 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 blah. So we're just going to get right to it and say he had a knife literally from space. Specifically a small dagger, but whatever effing y'all, this thing is so sharp. To this day, the TSA would tackle you sooner than let you board anything with it. They found it in Tut's tomb in 1920s with all that other magical treasury hunky dory that they stole out of there, and it was originally believed to be forged from the iron heart of a meteorite. Originally, ah, keyword, see, Egyptians didn't have the ability to smell. They weren't actually suitably advanced in that realm. So they especially wouldn't be able to forge a weapon from space metal, let alone crack open a meteorite to get to it, or know that was even an option. This has led historians to presume that the dagger was a gift from a foreign nation that did possess smelty technology. While historians are pretty confident the foreign nation wasn't the Martians, they haven't explicitly ruled that out either, so I guess those ancient alien guys might have a point. If you like stuff like this, check out our top 10 alien hieroglyphs found in ancient history video. The story of how two pharaohs throw down over pet hippos. So, Pharaoh Sekinenri Teo, I'm gonna call him Sek, the second, kept a pool full of pet hippopotamuses, letting his massive pets splash and play all day. Obviously, you don't get close because these are blind rage death animal machines, but this guy loved his hippos so much he could kill for them. He was willing to die for them. In fact, he literally did just that. This is back when Egypt was divided, and the most powerful Egyptian kingdom was called Haikos, which was ruled by Pharaoh Apopi. Being a lesser king, Sek was required to pay tributes to Apopi out of respect. He could handle the humiliation of living under the tyranny of another man, RIP fragile male ego, but as long as Apopi didn't rub it in or act like an ass about it. So that's exactly what Apopi did. He went right for the sore spot by telling Sek to get rid of his hippos. Apparently, they were too loud and Apopi couldn't sleep at night in his own house that was 750 kilometers away. Yeah, no. Sek says, hey, I can handle you bullying me constantly, but leave the hippos out of this. And he would not tolerate any further insults to his hippos. This, he declared, was grounds for war. That's what they did. Sek even died in combat, fighting for his right to a hippo pool. The war didn't end when he died, however. His son kept it going. Two generations of kings fought for a hippo pool. And in time, they won. By the end of the war, Egypt had unified once more. All because of one man's love for his hippos. And speaking of, after that unification happened, it paved the way for the royal trendsetter Narmer. Because before our boy Narmer came along, the red crown of Lower Egypt and the white crown of Upper Egypt were worn by the pre-dynastic kings. Narmer was famously the first king to be portrayed wearing both crowns symbolizing that union. This would later be replaced with the striped crown, a continuous representation of union called a nemesis. Adorning the top was the uraeus, an upright cobra that symbolized Symbolize the ancient Egyptian goddess Wajet, meaning the pharaoh was ready to strike his enemies with deadly venom. Trendsetter Narmer doesn't stop at crowns, he's the first ruler to portray themselves in a royal beard, which every Egyptian pharaoh wore afterwards, whether man or woman. Then there's Narmer's implementation of an official who has the most important task of carrying the pharaoh's magic sandals. Egyptian pharaoh's sandals were the only piece of clothing that separated them from the land of Egypt and rightfully symbolized the union between the heavenly god world and the earthly human world. King Tut's sandals were famously inscribed with pictures of his enemies. Meaning with every step, he was crushing the enemy's Egypt. In the famous Narmer palette, he's also seen wearing a fake bull tail, which symbolized strength to rule the country of the Nile, but that trend didn't stick. Hey, so Ramses has 50 lost daughters. What a crappy dad, doesn't know where all his kids even are. Kinda understandable when you have 102 of them, with about 9 women, however. Made possible by somehow living to be 91 in an age where people died at like 20. Suffice to say, he had lots of leisure time. Of course, not all the children were children at the same time. Ramses the second began his family long before he took over as king, and he reigned for 66 years. He spread the brood out over most of that time. So archaeologists announced in 1820 they uncovered a tomb built by Ramses, and that 52 or so of his sons happened to be in it. They finally recently started excavations after a few decades, and now we know that the mausoleum is the largest and most complex found to date in Egypt's Valley of the Kings, with at least 62 rooms. But Egyptian kings normally didn't build mausoleums for their offsprings. Their principal wives, yes, over in the Valley of Queens, but their kids, no. If it turns out that only Ramesses' sons are in the tomb, where are the 50 daughters? Sexism can answer that. Males were regarded as potential heirs to the throne, and the princesses were not, so they weren't held in high esteem and didn't get a fancy resting place. Doesn't mean they didn't have value. Ramesses designated at least three of his daughters as princess queens. Woo! No? No, oh, no. What that suggests isn't pretty. But what isn't known is whether or not they were actually married to him and, you know, producing, or if the title was a way of honoring selected daughters from tertiary wives. Historians, however, are pretty calm 
confident on which one it is. This would be the end of the story, but for a single question. Why would a latex protection manufacturer name its product for a man who had 102 kids? Are you choosing cats or your empire? In Egypt, the penalty for killing a cat was death. This wasn't just a law against cruelty to animals or sadistic Friday the 13th butchery. All you had to do was accidentally run over a cat with your chariot and you're done. This is mostly due to the animal being closely linked with the cat headed goddess of warfare and balls of twine, Bastet. They were also revered for the role they played in protecting food stores and homes from disease by killing pests like snakes and rats. Basically, pharaohs coined the three laws of robotics a millennia before Asimov and used them to protect the thing that poops under the stairs. And I, I don't think there are exceptions. One writer, Didoris Siculus, even recorded that the king of Egypt himself personally tried to intervene and save a Roman man who had accidentally killed a cat. His people did not give a single F, however, ignored the ruler, showed no mercy, caring literally negative a thousand if it meant risking war with Rome. They formed a mob, hung him, and left his body in the streets while the pharaoh sent a real awkward fruit basket apology to Rome. Perhaps the greatest example of a pharaoh placing the well being of cats above that of his own people, however, was Pharaoh Pismatic III literally told his army not to fight the Persians' advancement because these smart little twists had painted the image of Bastet on their shields and marched behind a line of dogs, sheep, and cats. In their words, whatever animals the Egyptians hold dear. The Egyptians, under threat of death from the pharaoh, had no choice but to let the Persian ruler walk straight into the city unchecked. He then murked anyone who dared to challenge him, using the shields with cats drawn on them because you can't even strike an image of a cat in ancient Egypt. Cambyses, the ruler's name, celebrated in a dignified noble fashion, marching the Egyptian armies past him as he threw cats at them and screamed insults at their gods. We aren't 100% sure who the first pharaoh was, but it was probably Catfish Chisel. The only way we know the lineage for early Egyptian kinship is the highly damaged Palermo Stone, which was a black slab of granite carved full of the names of kings up to the 5th dynasty. The part of the stone where the first and second king of the 1st dynasty is inscribed is bust to clean off. Although it is generally accepted that the first king was Narmer, aka Menes. The second one was Aha. Even without enough evidence to prove beyond a doubt, I can't get past the Aha thing. The name of Narmer is composed to two ideograms. The catfish reading as Nar and the chisel reading as Mer. The location of Narmer's body has eluded archaeologists for two centuries now. The first Egyptian pharaohs used to build a type of tomb called a Mabasta and they did so until the third dynasty when they started busting out pyramids. It's theorized Narmer is in one of those. But then Egyptologists have discovered a large field of pre-dynastic and early dynastic royal tombs in Umm al-Kab and the Narmer's name is identified in an inscription found. However, this is Egypt. The site had suffered disturbances, tomb robbing, and distress for the past 5,000 years, making it impossible to know which one of the bodies is the precise tomb of Narmer. To this day, archaeologists and Egyptologists disagree on whether Narmer was buried at Saqqara or Umm al-Kab, and in the end, his cause of death isn't even fully known. Just that of a philosopher, Mantheo, saying the reign of Narmer ends when he was carried off by a hippopotamus and perished. And last but not least, Believe my eyes, even though it may be a lie. Who knows? I don't, but I love a good rhyme. While it was likely a disease genetically inherited in its DNA, the official Egyptian story is that Pharaohs was cursed by the gods with blindness. Apparently, when the Nile was flooding, Pharaohs got fed up with it, and instead of letting the water do its thing and calm down, he chucked a spear at it. Because yes, throwing a spear at a river would probably change things. For his insolence and stupidity, the gods struck his ass. Pharaoh's vibes this way the best he can for 10 years before he meets an oracle that either wanted to pull history's most hilariously mean prank or genuinely believed the gods had passed on this message. But the oracle tells Pharaoh's all he's got to do is wash his eyes with the urine of a woman who's never slept with any other person than her husband her whole life. Okay. Well, Pharaoh's isn't asking questions, he's here for solutions. He finds his wife and says, babe, I want to spice things up in the bedroom, I have an idea. And the two of them give it a try. Only it doesn't work. So now he's still blind, and his wife has some explaining to do. Before she does that though, Pharaoh's needs some more urine and he needed it now. So every woman in town is gathered up and given a pot, which he then sat there dumping its contents into his eyes, one after each other. No, I don't know if he waited for it to cool down. I do know it was probably the color of French's mustard though, seeing as Egyptians literally only drank warm beer. So so imagine. But somehow Pharaoh's finds the one who's not cheating on her husband or hadn't banged someone before getting married and one of these warm beer pee buckets works. And I wish I was kidding, but the official Egyptian records say yeah, magic pee 
did this. His sight is back and he asks for the hand of the magic pea wielding woman so they can marry on the spot. All the while her husband awkwardly watches the consequences of his wife not cheating on him unfold. Oh and then Pharaoh's burned his old wife to death. Or at least that's how the legend goes. I highly doubt that it really did restore his eyesight and maybe he just ordered historians to write a good story to explain a weird habit. You know, f fetish. We got a f fetish here. Sammy Kicking off our list at number 10, Ancient Egyptian Eyeliner. Whenever you see hieroglyphics or any art depicting the great pharaohs, they're usually rocking some impressive eyeliner. They look great, right? Like a 90s pop star, they look awesome. Ancient Egyptians were the OG eyeliner users. They made their own eyeliner from lead salts. And no, before you think about getting creative, do not try this at home. This wasn't an ideal process. See, for starters, these salts were quite high in lead concentration. So in order to avoid that mess, ancient Egyptians first had to process and then filter that lead salt for up to 30 days in order to get the lead levels low enough to even be applied. So you had to plan accordingly. You're like, oh, I have a pharaoh date in 30 days? Perfect. We'll start now. It was a hazard if done incorrectly. Not only was this ancient beauty practice, well, beautiful to look at, but Egyptians also needed eyeliner to protect against sun damage as well as fight off any infections. Yeah, we don't encourage rubbing lead on your eyes today. We have a few different methods on, you know, how to look good. I think. None of them include lead, hopefully, ideally. Number nine, hair gel. Back in my day in high school, I had to use Dippity Do Extra Hold Hair Gel. Yeah, it showed a scale on the side. I always got the five out of six hold. That was good. Six was too much. Nobody ever did the full six. That's crazy talk. But in ancient Egypt, we didn't have styling, spiking glue, and blasting free spray by DJ Polly D. No, we have that today, unfortunately, but back then, a little different. Back then, ancient Egyptians loved styling their hair, but again, before DJ Polly D was born, what is a pharaoh to do? If the Great Pyramids are any indication, they knew something that we didn't. Ancient Egyptians knew how to keep their hair in one place all day long. And that heat too, how do you do it? My curls, I'm jealous. Their hair styling gel was made with shea butter and coconut oil. But more often than not, they would replace coconut oil with almond oil. So this was a completely natural and strengthening styling gel. Gosh, so today we have whatever that is. Psst, ice spray, that's awesome. DJ Polly. psst. No. Number eight, coffee scrub. I love coffee. I don't think I love coffee enough to do a coffee face scrub, but hey, never say never. I'll try anything once. Ancient Egyptians would use coffee scrub to reduce inflammation, improve blood circulation, and since it's a ground up material, it's gonna remove those dead skin cells at the same time. Next holiday season, grab your aunt some coffee scrub. Just tell her how it reduces puffiness, improves the skin's texture, all that good stuff. It'll give you that youthful feral look that you've been going for, you know what I mean? Merry Christmas, here you go, coffee on your face. Using grounded coffee powder to exfoliate your skin sounds like a new idea. It's certainly a hot trend today. But before TikTok, ancient Egyptians already knew these benefits. Damn, I'm gonna get a coffee scrub. Maybe I'll do it, I don't know. After I'm done this cup, I'll just rub it on my face, on my desk, and see what uh, everyone says. Number seven, dead sea salt. You'll never feel more alive than when you use dead sea salt. Here we go. Ancient Egyptians were ahead of the exfoliation game. Dare I say, they invented it. Not only were coffee scrubs a necessity, but salt from the Dead Sea was one of the most popular popular ancient Egyptian skincare products ever. We traveled far and wide for this one. Salt collected from the Dead Sea was used to exfoliate dead skin cells, and it was so well known at this point that, rumor has it, Cleopatra herself would travel all the way to the Dead Sea from Egypt just to take a bath. Yeah, let's be honest, after this point, we'd all love a rejuvenating Dead Sea float. That sounds way better than what I've got at home. Well, bath probably can't even fit in this thing. Dead Sea sounds way better. I once left a house party earlier to go have a bath. Swear to God, York University. Dipped at like 10 o'clock. I was like, I'm cold, I'm not doing this. 40 minute walk, worth it. Leave your friends for a bath, do it. Number six, wax cones. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. You've probably seen them in a thumbnail here at some point. The art depicting head cones is quite unique looking. It's like a pharaoh with a triangle on their head. You're like, what's happening there? What is this? Is this like Illuminati? What is this? Long before Pantene Pro-V, when it came to head cleanliness, these triangular wax cones were here to save the day. And they looked pretty fun to use. I don't know. They would just sit on top of your head. You didn't need to mix anything with lead for 30 days or burn or anything like that. You don't need to put any organs in jars, just a wax cone atop of your head. Easy. Back in 2019, experts found archeological evidence that they were in fact used. So yeah, not just a glyph. 
real life history. So I have to bring this up. Men and women alike would wear this cone and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone down and through your hair. The cone itself was made of oils, fat, resin. It would be placed on their wig or directly onto your head and it would keep melting and refreshing all day long. It's like a little candle almost. A nice little human candle. A nice little Egyptian man candle. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. It's a little easier nowadays. I'm too tall too. I can't have a wax cone. Are you kidding me? It would hit this mic. No way. Number five, fake beards. I can't grow a beard, so maybe I'll just start rocking the, the fake one, you know, like Hatshepsut. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. The pharaoh, fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was all done as an act of politics. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose the third, and he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this bearded pharaoh that we're pretty sure we figured out. Number four, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with a, an interesting method on getting rid of those pimples, that's for sure. Remind you, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, so. Again, creative. Physicians back then discussed pimples as these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin from four to five years. And by squeezing these spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots in there. I don't know. I'd be sick. See ya, now we're single. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. Hey, if a physician ever told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses on my persons, I would faint. That's the scariest news. I've ever heard in my life. That's some bad news, man. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah. Oh, you have acne? Hmm. Are you sure you're not turning into a bird? Maybe it's that. Come back next week. Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne, hopefully. Sorry, maggots, not acne. Maggots. All to get rid of maggots. I'm gonna go throw up. Number three, prosthetics. The ancient Egyptians were a culture of firsts and some of their achievements we still have no idea how they were able to accomplish. Like the pyramids? I couldn't tell you. Could you? Didn't think so. Hit that thumbs up. We're both wrong. We're both learning. It's very likely that some of the first ever prosthetics were used in ancient Egypt. How fascinating. Imagine being the first guy to make a toe, a fake toe. A female mummy who was discovered near Luxor had her death dated somewhere between 950 and 710 BCE. And she was also found with a prosthetic toe made from wood and leather on her person. While this of course is a wonderful cosmetic replacement and it's no secret that the ancient Egyptians certainly valued aesthetics, it seems as though this prosthetic toe was completely functional and was actually used to help this woman walk. The toe, after it was discovered, had significant signs of wear and tear, which then inspired experts to start a study, look a little further. And they did. So they took participants and tested their gait, both with and without the use of a replicated toe. And in ancient Egypt, the common footwear were sandals and walking in them would have been uh, next to impossible without a big toe. So it's clear that this prosthetic was very helpful and important to those similar to this Luxor mummy. Not exactly a beauty practice, but I'm sure they also felt a little more more confident with that toe. This is also too impressive to exclude. Beauty list. I'm like, yeah, toes are beautiful. Why not? Throw them on. Number two, henna. I got henna done a few years ago and I totally blanked. I forgot that it lasted longer than like two days. I was like, day four, I'm like, what's going on, man? Is this permanent? While on one hand, pun intended, it is beautiful. Ancient Egyptians use of henna went beyond style and beyond imaging oneself after the gods. See, henna also has cooling effects on the body and ancient Egypt was, uh, was quite hot. It was used by ancient Egyptians to color their hair hair and fingernails and shades of red and orange. Now this shade, this exact shade, also provided comfort on hot days. Come back with some henna, that's kinda nice. It lasts longer than a few days though, just so you know, if you wanna get henna, it's important to know. That guy did not tell me in Greece. No, he did not. And finally, number one, deodorant. When it comes to deodorant, today we listen to the Old Spice guy. He's always whistling about something new. But long before he was born, ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs for deodorant. They made perfumes and oils, this is commonly known, but they were also the first to use any type of deodorant. Deodorant, like underarm deodorant. It was so impressive. Ostrich eggs mixed with a little fat and tamarisk and tortoise shell and then nuts. Mix them all together and bam, there you go. You're ready for date night. Just apply all of that on your body. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. See, Egyptians would also use porridge balls. How creative is that? Flavored porridge rolled up and safely tucked in in your underarm right there. Right there on your little smelly chicken wing. This morning I had some deodorant just crumble apart when I was applying it. You ever have that happen? Turns to fetish cheese all of a sudden, mid-application. Now my bathroom sink looks like a Greek salad. It smells great, but 
not practical. Might have to go back to the porridge ball method. Who knows? Maybe I have one right now. Maybe that's why I haven't moved this arm the whole time. Who knows? All right, so the Cambiuses are up first. Cambius was the son of Cyrus the First and the succeeder of his father in Anshan as the king of Agistius of Media. According to the 5th century BC Greek historian Herodotus, Cambius married a daughter of Astidius, by whom he became the father of Cyrus the Second. Cambius the Second, aka Cyrus the Second, performed the ritual duties of the Babylonian king at the important New Year festival of 538 and of 530. Before Cyrus set out on his last campaign, he was appointed the regent in Babylon. That campaign was the conquest of Egypt, planned by Cyrus, and was a major achievement of Cambius's reign once captured. This is the lunatic who liked to torture animals for entertainment and notoriously killed the Apis bull to torment the Greeks who worshipped it. Cambius was traveling through Syria on his way back to Persia when he first heard reports of a revolt there. And then he died mysteriously in Syria in the summer of 522, either by his own hand or as the result of an accident. This is one of the few Persian families to have held the throne, the Xerxes line. First we have the granddaddy Xerxes I, or the Great as titled by the fifth Persian king. He was the son of Darius the Great and his reign lasted from 486 BC to 465 BC. He's well known in history for his attempted invasion of Greece and how later in the same year he was defeated in the Battle of Salamis, which led him to flee his own kingdom. He's known as both a Persian ruler and a pharaoh as when he ruled Egypt, it was also part of the Persian Empire. Little is known about the last years of Xerxes' life. After his reversal in Greece, he withdrew into himself and allowed himself to be drawn into his harem intrigues, in which he was, in fact, only a pawn. Thus, he disposed of his brother's entire family at the demand of the queen. He was assassinated by his own commander of the royal bodyguard forces. Another son, Artaxerxes the first succeeded in retaining power. Artaxerxes the first was given the throne by the commander of the guard, Artabanus, who had killed Xerxes. It's fine though, because Xerxes Jr. got his daddy's lick back when he kills Arta about a month later. His reign, though generally peaceful, was disturbed by several insurrections, the first of which was the revolt of his brother. During his reign, Artaxerxes completed the Hall of 100 Columns at Persepolis, rebuilt the palace of Darius I at Susa after a fire, and Artaxerxes died of natural causes in 424 BCE, having ensured a peaceful succession by naming Xerxes II his legitimate heir. Xerxes II reigned for only a little over a month, however, before he was assassinated. Next is the Dossier line. Starting with Dossi Dajer from the Second Kingdom, Egypt's Third Dynasty. He undertook the construction of the earliest important stone buildings in Egypt. His reign, which probably lasted 19 years, was marked by great technological innovation in the use of stone architecture. The innovative structure was a departure from the traditional use of mud bricks alongside stone. The greatest advance, however, was the completion of alteration of the shape of a monument from a flat-topped rectangular structure known as a mastaba to a six-stepped pyramid. This great character built the famous pyramid and set up the construction mechanisms of large buildings, paving the way for successors of their kingdom for even more daring constructions. The Pyramid of Dossier is the first pyramid in history of ancient Egypt and therefore potentially all of humanity. It is a degree pyramid that is at the center of a funerary complex of great importance. It's located in the necropolis of Saqqara. Sekhemet is probably the brother or eldest son of King Dossier. Little is known about this king since he ruled for only a few years. However, he erected a step pyramid at Saqqara and left behind a well-known rock inscription at the Wadi Makara. No pep in his servant steps for sure, it's Pepe. So Pepe the first kills the game. He does a great job ruling Egypt. He initiated the policy of, of intensive penetration of Nubia south of the first Nile cataract. Inscriptions record journeys southward early in his reign and fragments of vessels bearing the king's name were excavated in Karma. Meanwhile, Pepe the second is the longest running Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. He's also believed to be the youngest ruler ever in Egyptian history. Pepe the second was the son of Pepe the first, obviously, and was born late into his father's reign. While he was still very young, he succeeded his half-brother Marine, who died at an early age. His mother served as regent for a number of years, and the old group of officials serving the royal family maintained the kingdom's stability. During the first half of his rule, he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half? 
nowhere close. You see a sharp decline of the old kingdom as economic disarray is caused by him virtually having no oversight. Powerful provincial nobles drew talent away from the capital and because of the unusually long reign of the king, Egypt had a senile ruler when it needed vigorous leadership. Those of Pepe's children who survived him had brief ephemeral reigns and failed to cope with the political and economic crisis that arose as the 6th dynasty ended. His tomb may be more famous than he is, Menkures. His tomb, the Pyramid of Menkure, is one of three pyramids of Giza alongside his statue triads that show the king together with his wives and various deities. It's the smallest of the three main pyramids of Giza, just 62 meters tall, but has one of the most complex and best preserved structures. He had two wives, both are his sisters naturally, and they didn't have much luck with sons at first. Three in total and one daughter. At his death, his successor, his son, Shafaskek, completed the stonework walls of the mortuary temple in brick. Menaku was not succeeded by his eldest son, who actually predeceased him, but rather by Shepsake, a younger son. Shepsake built a monumental mastaba at the South Accra and was the only kingdom ruler to not build a pyramid. This family's work, especially the Great Pyramids, show a great mastery of monumental stoneworking. Individual blocks were larger, colossal, and were extremely accurately fitted. They were good, and then they were great, and then they were absolute trash. The Amenhotep. All right, so on the top of the bucket, we got Amen One. He's the great great granddaddy. He effectively extended Egypt's boundaries into Nubia. Next is great granddaddy Amen the Second, who was an army leader with famous archery and battle skills. Supposedly, he was able to shoot arrows straight through a thick of copper plates. His athletic ability was incredible, and he was known to have rowed a ship faster than 200 of Egypt's strongest navy men. Next is granddaddy Amen the Third, who built himself endless monuments and temples. Perhaps his most famous construction was the Temple of Luxor in Thebes. This temple has become one of the grandest and most famous temples in Egypt. His diplomatic relations allowed art and culture to flourish, and his building projects are legendary. And then there's disastrous daddy Akhenaten, or Amen the Fourth. This nutcase was obsessed with the sun god Atum and changed his name, appearance, politics, lifestyle, anything he could to feel closer to his lord. This pharaoh was so hated that Egyptians themselves wiped his name from their history. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Armana and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean the horizon of Aten and then ordered a new capital city be built there, moving an estimated 20,000 people over to make it. When he enforced monotheism, Og failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the nation's socio-economic cultural hubs, who was the god priest that oversaw all of their industries. So without them, those pillars of the communities were just gone. And stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest reception. And then we've got the bottom of the bucket, we have our boy Tukmahad, aka King Tut, who by his third year changed his name to Tukmahad and issued decree restoring temples, images, personnel, and privileges of the old gods to undo what his dad had done. He also began the protracted process of restoring the sacred shrines of Amun, which had been severely damaged during his father's rule. No prescription or persecution of Atan though, Akmahan's god, was undertaken, and royal vineyards and regiments of the army were still named after Atan. Tukmahad unexpectedly died in his 19th year, whatever the case, he died without designating an heir. This is another four part family tree. First, great granddaddy Snerfu founds the fourth dynasty and marries the daughter of the last pharaoh of the third empire, thus helped to solidify his possession as the pharaoh of the new dynasty, as well as secure Khufu's place in the line of succession. Meanwhile, his son, who becomes granddaddy Khufu, pops out the great pyramid of Giza, one of the seven wonders of the world. Apparently, we were so impressed by this that we forgot to write anything else about him or why he did this because we know very little about Khufu. We know he reigned 23 years between 2500 and 2566, and we know he married his sister. Shocker. Khufu traded for highly rare items, prizing both construction materials and precious materials like copper and turquoise, and so he developed the mining industry in Egypt. Limestone and granite were also quarried in vast amounts for rather large building projects that he was working on. Built over a period of 27 years, the Great Pyramid is undoubtedly Khufu's greatest legacy. Khufu's children include nine sons and six daughters, including Defreya and Khafri, who would both become pharaohs following his death. When in power, his son Defreya moved eight kilometers north of Giza and established a new necropolis on a higher leveled ground. Defreya's pyramid was quarried for its stone, and as such, there's very little of it left standing today. Meanwhile, the underson Khafri succeeded the short lived Radifi and married his sister and two other queens who were probably his sisters. Best known for his pyramid, 
pyramid, one of the three great pyramids of Giza, and also best known for the Sphinx, which bears his likeness on its face. And who else but the Ramses clan? The Ramses the first gets the throne in a super uneventful way. He was friend and confidant to the former pharaoh who didn't have a single heir. Then Ramses spent all of his free time marrying all four of his daughters. Meanwhile, his son, Seti the first, led a great army of 60,000 men and fought in many battles north of Palestine and Syria. King Ramses the second, son of Seti the first, was able to finish his father's work by beating the Hittite army in battle of Kadesh and creating the first documented peace treaty in history. Ramses the second went on to declare himself a god and rule Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is insane in an era where life expectancy was 30. But before getting to that ripe old age, Ramses spent any free time he had chasing anything with two feet and a heartbeat, enough to sire 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his own sons, leaving no heir. They're back again, the Ptolemies. People loved learning about this batch of literal bastards in the recent top 10 powerful families in history you didn't want to mess with video. Apparently y'all like when I'm doing tongue twisters. For those who don't know why this family could be a tongue twister, an important note is that they always recycled the family names, men always named Platonomy, and women always named Cleopatra or Berenice. They also happen to really, really, really take the old Egyptian ideology of royals only being with other royals a little too seriously. What's created is a massive family tree, one full of manipulation contempt, scandal, and brash killings. While the Plutonomies started off strong, building the Library of Alexandria, compiled a star catalog and the earliest surviving table of trigonomic function, and establishing mathematically that an object is and its mirror image must make an equal angles to be a mirror. After the fourth, however, the family became like the Kardashians, talentless and messy. They took up everybody's time, but nobody stopped the free entertainment. So like last time, let me limber up and I'll run us through some of the notorious BS. Plutonomy killed his mother who had killed her husband who was having a love affair with her mother and then married his sister Aronso III who was then later killed after Plutonomy IV died. Plutonomy XII annoyed his children so much, particularly his daughter Berenice IV, that they rebelled against him and drove him from Egypt. Berenice IV ruled briefly. She probably had her sister killed. She certainly had her husband strangled who wasn't a family member. She was beheaded on the orders of her father. Plutonomy XII. Plutonomy IV 14 was the younger brother of Cleopatra 7, that's the Mark Antony one, and possibly poisoned by that same sister. Platonomy 7 was then killed by his uncle, the next Platonomy 8, at a wedding feast, or he may have been killed by his own father, Platonomy 4. Scholars disagree. It's so messy, my mouth's so dry. Let's go on to the next one. Our favorite bearded lady was part of this family. It's the Thutmos line. Granddaddy Thutmos I became king after Amenthal died without an heir. Probably one of the previous monarchs generals, he came to the throne around age 40 and is thought to have ruled for a little over 10 years. Historians have generally described Somos II as a frail and ineffectual, just the sort of person that a purposely shrewish hapshaput could push around. Public monuments, however, depict a dutiful hapshaput standing appropriately next to her husband. Wife to Tutu, Hapshaput failed in the more important duty of producing a son. So when Thutu died young in 1497, yet again, the throne went to a harem child. Duly named Thutmos III, Three, this child was destined to become one of the great warrior kings of Egypt, but at the time of his father's death, he was too young to take the rule. As widow, Hat became regent leader until Thut came of age. Within a few years, however, she proclaimed herself pharaoh, a vile absurd. And the seven years past that point, she'd taken up cross-dressing imagery. Once depicted as slim and graceful queen, is now full-blown, flail and crook wielding king with the broad bare chest of a man and the ferric false beard, but also still long flowing hair and feminine features. Upon Hat's death in 1458, her stepson, then likely in his early 20s, finally ascended to the throne. Thutmose III was a skilled warrior who brought Egypt's empire to the zenith of its power by conquering all of Syria and crossing the Euphrates. The spoils from his many wars made Thutmose III the richest man in the world. His military accomplishments are recorded on the numerous monuments he built himself. Mr. Unpopular, Xerxes I, is number 10. Xerxes is one of two pharaohs on the list who wasn't actually Egyptian. Egyptian. And it ultimately puts Homi in some hot water. He ruled during the 27th dynasty whilst Egypt was a part of the Persian Empire, having the throne.
throne from 486 to 465 BC. These Persian kings were acknowledged as a pharaoh despite not being Egyptian, so Xerxes the Great, as he was known, earns a place on our list by virtue of fame. He wasn't so great to the Egyptians though. He had a disregard for their traditions and religious beliefs and allocated funds away from their temple. He also banged his niece and gave her the robe that his wife had made for him, so his wife had her sister-in-law mutilated as revenge. It was this whole big scandal. But it caused Xerxes brother to try and usurp him, something that Xerxes was already dealing with constantly as back at home in Babylonia as well as in Egypt people were trying to steal the throne away from him, causing him to ping pong back and forth between the two places. When he wasn't doing that, Xerxes was failing disastrously at trying to invade Greece. Eventually the embarrassment of his consistent failure to do so and the endless coup attempts on him was a bit too much and Xerxes abandoned the Egyptian throne. His failed attempts to invade Greece ensured that his portrayal by Greek historians and and by extension, the film 300 hasn't been very kind. Number nine is a famous hussy, Ramses II. This man could not keep it in his pants. Sure, 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 sure. He was the greatest leader of the 19th dynasty and an amazing tactical mind and made Egypt prosperous, blah, blah. He's the son of Seti I, and Ramses went on to declare himself a god and the ruler of Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is an insane number for an era where the life expectancy was 30. But home Homeboy was not a modest pharaoh by any means. He was a lying, two-faced politician who based his entire campaign on a laundry list of fabrications. The extensive architectural legacy of his reign are thought to have left the throne close to bankruptcy at the time of his death. Before getting to that ripe old age, as mentioned, Ramesses spent any free time he had Banging. Enough to sire between 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his sons. Ramses was one of the first rulers to take on the title of the Great before it was cool. All in all, he was pompous and spoiled. He left behind more statues of himself than any other person in the history of the world. He was obsessed with outshining all those who came before him, and he would tower over all those that would follow. Speaking of testament to ego, number eight is Khufu, the son of Seneferu, which I'm probably butchering, who is the first pharaoh to build pyramids. Khufu was on a one-upping mission since day one. He commissioned the Pyramids of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world, which by the way we learned not too long ago is lopsided. The pyramid was originally covered in white limestone adorned with gold and since stripped away by greedy tourists over the last 4,000 plus years. He used his platform to also establish mining and trade from what's now modern day Lebanon. Unfortunately, while he brought greatness to Egypt in ways of infrastructure and economy, socially he inspired a lot of mixed reviews due to his use of forced labor and a dismissive nature. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus was a particular critic, depicting Khufu as a vicious tyrant who used slaves to build his great pyramid. Now, many Egyptologists believe that these claims are merely defamatory, guided by the Greek viewpoint that such structures could only be built through greed and misery. If those rumors are true, then Khufu had high expectations and forced labor and no one liked him. If they're not, then he wasn't a bad guy at all. Number seven is Cambyses, the animal hater. This this is the other Persian pharaoh on our countdown, and he too enjoyed picking on the Egyptians he ruled, but in a very indirect way. See, Cambyses enjoyed watching animals suffer. It's said in his spare time he put on fights between lion cubs and puppies and made his wife watch as they tore each other apart. In fact, nearly every story coming out of Egypt at the time of his rule told about Cambyses involved him ruining the life of one animal or another. Early on, he went to see Apis, the bull that Egyptians treated as a god. Right in front of the priests dedicated to Apis, he pulled out a dagger and just start stabbing the bull until it died, laughing at them and saying, this is a god worthy of the Egyptians. What a prick. Number six is Menkuar, the pharaoh who refused death. Even though the title of pharaoh calls them undying and the pyramids are built to take them to the afterlife, you can't blame a person for still being fearful of what happens after they close their eyes for the last time. 25th century BC pharaoh Menkuar is the poster boy for that fear. An oracle once came to him and reportedly told him he only had six years left to live. Menkuar was terrified and decided to do everything he could to avoid it, even fool the gods. His biggest plan revolved around the idea that as long as night never came, a new day could never start. If a new day doesn't begin, time couldn't pass, so he couldn't die, right? 
Right. Anyways, on this basis, for the rest of his life, he lit up all the lamps he could and convinced himself it was always daytime. He would not sleep and force countless serfs to suffer with him this way. Every night, he stayed up drinking and celebrating the success until the day he died, because the gods will always have the last laugh. Sorostis, the genital king, is number five. Why genital king? Well, aside from being one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, he commemorated his success in a unique way by setting up a big pill with a picture of someone's genitals on it. Male or female, he wasn't picky. He sent warships and troops to every corner of the known world and stretched his kingdom further than anyone else ever had, leaving these pillars on sites of every battleground. Aside from Gen the pillars were of course ingrained with how he had subdued his enemies and how certain he was that the gods were in favor of his invade everyone policy. Quite cocky of him. The genitals depicted were based off of how valiantly their opponents had fought their invasion. Male depiction indicated that they were strong and brave soldiers. But the female depiction, well, it meant the word that we are all thinking. These pillars lore left all across the continent and they stood the test of time. 1500 years later, after being erected, they still stand in sea Syria, engraved with the genitals of failure. Look up the word spoil and you'll see number 4 is Pepe II. He was the longest ruling Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. The first half of this rule he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half, nowhere close. In fact, it's the mark of the sharp decline of the old kingdom of Egypt as economic disarray was due to him virtually having no oversight. Pepe was made pharaoh in his early teen years, so naturally he got the spoiled brat treatment from mommy. A great example is shortly after being crowned, an explorer sent to trade and collect ivory, ebony, and other precious items had written him a letter reporting that he had met a dancing pygmy. Why? This is the greatest thing Pepe had ever heard! He had to see it for himself. So he demanded its transport back immediately and to abandon all precious materials they'd gathered in return for a high reward. Well, he got his dancing pygmy and he got pretty much everything he's ever asked for. He learned to accept that he was more important than other people. By the time he'd grown up, he was so corrupt that he made his surf strip naked cover themselves in honey and follow him around just to keep the flies away. Number 3 is the klepto gaslighting Amasis. He's remembered as a total prick. Amasis actually made his way onto the throne after the current pharaoh had sent him to calm down a rebellion, but when he got there he realized the rebels had a pretty good chance of winning, so he decided to lead them instead. Amasis decided the best way to tell the king about his change of sides and a declaration of war was by lifting his leg, farting, and telling the messenger to take that back to the king. He was a rampant alcoholic as well as a klepto Maniac. Apparently, he would steal his friends' stuff, put it in his own temples, and then try to convince them that they had never owned it in the first place. However, amongst all his bratty behavior, Amasis brought some major reform to oracles. One example actually comes from when he was a poor thief on the street. When he had been caught stealing, he'd been sent to stand in front of oracles who were supposedly be able to divine tell whether he was innocent or guilty. Well, once he was king, he remembered which oracles had pronounced him innocent of the crimes he had committed, had them punished for fraud. Because if they'd actually been able to speak to the gods, they would have known. He was always guilty. Number two is cutting down on crime. Actus Sains. Amasis wasn't tolerated for long and he was overthrown the way he'd done to his predecessor. This time, the rebellion was led by the Ethiopian Actus Sains, who believed in a gentler approach to kinghood. Actus Sains fought for the crown literally because of a magic spell he'd heard about and also to deal with Egypt's criminals in a flashy new way controlled exile. Every person who committed a crime he ruled would have their nose cut off and then they'd be sent off to the town he called Rhinochlora. Literally the town of cut off noses. It was exclusively populated by these now noseless criminals struggling to survive in the harsh landscape, drinking dirty water and eating trash or the odd stray quail that came through. Something like this may have seemed harsh, but it was actually considered benevolence at the time. Roman chronologers of Rhinocola, or Rhinocolora, whichever it's pronounced, wrote an example of how Actus Sains was actually considering a kindly manner towards his subjects. So keep that in mind when you're doing a comparison of now versus then. And in at number one is Akhenaten. This pharaoh was so hated that the Egyptians themselves wiped his name out of history. Born Amenhotep, he changed his name to Ahak, I'm gonna call him Ak, in accordance with this radical monotheistic drive. His new name meant that he is of service to the Aten, in honor of what he believed to be the one true god, Aten, the sun god. Acted everything in the name of the sun god. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Amarnia, and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean Horizon of Aten. And then he ordered a new capital city be built there. He chose the site because it was uninhabited. It was not the property of anyone else except Aten. He moved an estimated 20,000 people into this developing city and forced them to build it. These people had to push through 
worth everything. Based on the bones found in the town cemetery, more than two thirds of his workers broke a bone while they're working, and a good one third of them broke their spines. Almost everyone was malnourished. When he enforced monotheism, Ak failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the national, socioeconomic, and cultural hubs. It was the gods' priests that oversaw the industries of agriculture and craftsmanship through their patronage, and they who served as pillars of their communities. So by stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest recession, and an entire empire nearly collapsed because of him. So it's no wonder after his death, Egypt immediately went back to polytheism, and they also abandoned the new city he'd made them build. They destroyed his statues, his effigies, his monuments, and they removed him from their list of kings and history books. In fact, they did this so efficiently that we didn't really even know about him until his remains were found all alone in the city he had forced his subjects to create. In at number 10 is jewelry making. Egyptians saw deep spiritual significance in their jewelry, but also had a love of aesthetics. And those two things combined to create some of the most unique and lavish jewelry found in history. Worn to ward off spirits, protect health, bring good luck, and more, there were even certain colors and designs that were associated to certain gods and powers. And so Egyptian jewelers followed very strict rules regarding the mystical aspects of their jewelry creations. While a woman usually would not be a metal worker in Egyptian society, it was very common for her to be making jewelry. The tools were smaller and the process required less heat and thus less danger for her. Metal work techniques included precious metal sheets that were cut and shaped, notched together. Wire work was accomplished through strip twisting. Pieces could be held together with this wire stripping system or crimping techniques. These strips were also how link chains were accomplished as well as the securing of beads or the backs of earrings. And for jewelry designed exclusively for burial, the metal was often quite thin, as the jewelry of the deceased was not subjected to the wares of everyday life. Precious stones, ivory, real flowers, and shells were all common ornaments, as was name engravements, but it was more common with royalty. Jewelry makers were women of high status due to these contributions and the revelry jewelry held in ancient Egypt. For number nine, it's house vendors. Recognized as an ancient heritage profession, and was at its most popular during time periods of ancient Egypt where women were restricted from going out when married. These vendors would roam neighborhoods with buckets and baskets of product for sale. Clothing, perfume, fabric, snacks. Now, what was unusual is that the vendor was more often women than men. Walking the streets alone, making these sales because many married women weren't allowed to go out walking the streets alone to make sales. You see the irony. Anyways, this profession found great popularity in single women, and many also were called upon to act as nurses in homes of the wealthy when needed. The career is named Al Dalala, but the idea itself has long been extinct with the freedom for Egyptian women to roam commercial districts. Number eight is being a dancer. Ancient Egyptians loved their music and dance. They were celebratory, but also ritualistic at times. Farmers would dance to thank the gods for a good harvest. Dance groups would perform at banquets. People would go dance around the Nile in the lush season. The list goes on. Many men and women chose dance as a career, and it was a highly respected one. Dancing was considered an acceptable and normal part of life and even important to it. Most festivals were incomplete without it. In fact, dancing was such a revered career that dancers could start as a peasant and become a high status person from it. Just like being a celebrity in the way that people would go to see them perform. Women at the time were even more revered for their grace, elegance, and action. Acrobatics. This career had seven types of dance. Gymnastic, movement, pair dancing, imitative dance, which was like acting like animals, group dances, like a historic cheerleading squad, dramatic dance was female exclusive and rested in illustration, war dances, grotesque dance, and then religious chant dances at temples, and lyrical dance, which was usually a depiction of lovers. Wig makers are number seven. Egyptians loved wigs for a reason that surprises many. It helped keep their heads cool. I mean, it also helped with high hygiene and scalp pests and looking pretty, but the heat thing is what really gets folks. Many Egyptians had shaved or cropped hair, and the mesh-like base of a wig versus a headscarf allowed the body heat to still escape. And as said, wigs were also a great shield from lice or other invasive bugs. The hair used in the construction of wigs and hair extensions was always human and was either an individual's own hair or had been traded or bought. Hair itself was a valuable commodity ranked alongside gold and incense in a count list from the town of Cahoon, which puts emphasis on the popularity of wigs. When hair was collected for a wig, it was 
thoroughly combed and then sorted into lengths individually. The Egyptians invented a variety of hairdressing tools and the wig makers would take the time to braid or coil the hair depending on the wig style, coating each with warm beeswax and resin fixatives so that it would harden when cool. The job itself isn't unusual, more so the booming industry it had. Wigs weren't worn to this extent anywhere else at the time and while yes they were functional against the sun, they were more so aesthetic than anything. Individual braid and extensions could also be attached to someone's scalp for aesthetics, the way that box braids, twists, faux locks and many other ethnic hairstyles are accomplished today. Wigs were made in a type of factory setting. Archaeologists have uncovered the remain of wig factories, wig boxes have been found in tombs, and multiple mummies have been found with wigs or braided in extensions. Number 6 We meet our ladies of the night. Unlike most ancient and even modern civilizations, selling intercourse is illegal or was highly governed. In ancient Egypt, this wasn't even close to the case, but rather the opposite in a peculiar way. Women who worked in the sexual industries were considered divine and respectable, as their career was considered to please the gods. They earned high status and lived in luxury. Working freely and openly, these ladies adorned themselves with red lipstick and eye makeup that differentiated themselves from other women. They were also tattooed, diamond shaped dots along the thighs and on the fingers or images of the god Bess. When the French invaded, they brought STIs and they spread rapidly through the brothels and this prompted the French authorities to introduce a law forbidding French troops from entering the brothels or having these ladies in their rooms. Guess those ladies were hard to resist because anyone who offended the law received death penalty. Number 5 are the wet nurses. Wet nurses are found in all statuses and were for all statuses. One common denominator though is that the career kind of really sucked. Pun intended. So, first their social status was always determined by the status of who they were breastfeeding. Royal family, congrats on your special privileges, statues, private quarters, and your own tomb in the family pyramid. Also, her family would receive special perks as an extension of her. Now, royal families only wanted high status wet nurses, and while it's not clear how they were chosen, evidence suggests some kind of blood tie or faint familiar relation. Most wet nurses were from marginalized families in lower socioeconomic statuses and worked under conditions and pre definitive ways. Ages. Wet nurse requirements for any status were intense. She'd have to have given birth at least twice, have a large but healthy body due to the belief that large bodies were more nourishing. Despite that, her breasts should be medium. Too small, not enough food. Too big, the baby's spoiled. In addition to all of these prerequisites, the wet nurse should be sweet tempered, affectionate, and responsive to her charge. She should also abstain from intercourse because it could reduce her affection towards a child, and they also said no alcohol. A good call knowing what we know now. Wet nurses were women exploited for the products of their bodies. As slaves they were coerced for their milk, as lower social status women, they were employed for their bodies to enhance their inadequate domestic status. Even her own household suffered physically and monetarily if a wet nurse defaulted or failed a contract. On the same page, surrogates are number 4. This is a widespread practice in Egypt. The first story of surrogacy found in Genesis 16 of the Bible was the story of infertile Sarah having Egyptian Hagar carry her child for her and her husband Abraham. Even Egyptian pharaohs had used concubines to produce heirs. They often married their sisters or aunts, and children born of these marriages were most of the time not in great or functional health and wouldn't survive. Any child born of a concubine for a pharaoh was accepted as his lawful offspring. Now, they were quite limited in their rights and they could only inherit the throne in case of the absence of another more entitled heir. Surrogates experienced similar contracts and status leveling as wet nurses. They were desired to be mothers already, have a bigger, healthier body and naturally beauty was a desired element as well. Women of low status who made a career of surrogacy often died in childbirth or from hemorrhages due to the repetitive birthing process, but for some it was the only career they could have. Priestress is number 3 and so while it was a male dominated field, many women were employed as a priestress or a high priestress at the temples around Egypt. Mostly from upper status, many were married to the priests which they owed their position in society. Despite this, they played roles in the temple rituals, such as servicing goddesses Hathor, Neith, and Paquet, or working as dancers, musicians, singers, and acrobats in the temple. The most important priestress was known as the God's Wife Amun. This woman was usually the daughter of the pharaoh or sometimes his wife. She usually held a very high position in court and performed important rituals to honor the god Amun. The priestress was in charge of managing the gods' affairs, attending to ritual dances and performances, shaking their rattles and rattling their necklaces, which were long and heavily beaded objects. By the beginning of the New Kingdom in 1550, the title Chantress of Amun was used, and it was usually the wives of the priests who gained these elevated positions as well. The concept of a woman as a priest was unheard of in many kingdoms. A high
high priestess and the reverence and traditions of female gods being led by women were unusual to outsiders of Egypt who oftentimes restricted most priestly activities to just men. Number two is professional mourners. Okay, so here's a weird one. Professional or paid mourning is an occupation not only found in Egypt, but in China, the Mediterranean, and Eastern Europe. This practice is literally paying a stranger to attend a funeral to lament, deliver a eulogy, help comfort the family, entertain, or lay on the ground wailing. There's some range here, depends on what kind of funeral you want to have. These paid mourners made ostentatious displays, messy hair and smudged makeup, wailing, pounding on the ground or their chest, throwing themselves about as they smear dirt and sand all over their body while they screamed. It's a full spectacle. Now, another depiction of the paid mourners in Egypt is a little more chill. Two women impersonating the goddesses Isis and Nephthys. They were believed to play a special role in someone's death. Most inscriptions of a funeral where they are present as paid mourners, they are on each side of the corpse and their bodies are fully shaved. These women also had to be childless and have a tattoo of either Isis or Nephthys name on their shoulder. Most evidence of professional mourning is seen in pyramids and tomb inscriptions such as women holding their bodies dramatically in sorrow, braced over a casket with tears flowing. If you were a theater kid, this was definitely the type of job for you. And number one, it's the female physician. Egypt is a difficult one with historians. There's been a lot of largely ignored discoveries due to the opinions of those who found them. The evidence of women in ancient Egyptian medical fields is part of that because as it turns out, their physicians were actually primarily women. Evidence shows women in the medical profession going back into early dynastic period Egypt when Marit Ptah was the royal court's chief physician in 2700 BCE. She was the first female doctor known in world history, but there is another unnamed female physician who is listed to be the head of the Temple Neith Medical School in 3000 BCE, so maybe not. But either way, the first female doctor was in ancient Egypt. Women were highly respected throughout Egypt's history and many of their goddesses represented facets of health. Neith has been associated with the invention of birth and Hathor represents fertility. Four deities associated with healing are Heka, Sekhmet, Serket and Nephritim, which are all female. So, bizarre claims you may have heard that no women are involved in Egyptian medicine don't accord with the values of their civilization, which were incredibly equitable. By this reasoning, there were no women involved in anything of no anywhere in the world until the modern era, because history books make no mention of their contributions. But it's all up to say. Number two, Ramses II with a vengeance. As some of you may know, Ramses II was the greatest of the rulers of the 19th dynasty and second longest reigning pharaoh ever. He lived to the age of 90, was an amazing warrior, leading the armies of Egypt by the age of 22, and has literal tons of statues of himself all over Egypt. He is also probably a lot of people's ancestors since he had 96 sons and 60 daughters approximately. So yeah, it was kind of a big deal in 1881 when archaeologists discovered his mummy with a whole bunch of other ones in a secret chamber at Deir al Bari. Originally, Ramses was buried in the Valley of the Kings, as he should have been. But because of the risk of grave robbings, he was moved to a secret chamber. And then, after his discovery and stay at the museum in Cairo, he was moved again in the 70s when he got a passport to travel to Paris. This guy gets around. Number nine, Rosetta Stone. You are too fine to be laying down in bed alone. I can teach you my language, Rosetta Stone. Man, we all miss the old Drake. Girl, don't tempt me. Anyway, speaking of diamonds in the rough, the Rosetta Stone, pretty, pretty shocking and important find. What is it? Well, basically, it's a large stone tablet that has the same paragraph written on it in three separate languages. Why is this so important, you may ask? Well, it's basically helped us learn everything we know about ancient Egypt. More specifically, translating Egyptian to Greek and then to English. Or, since it was discovered by some of Napoleon's people and forces, uh, it would have been in French. To put it in modern terms, it's as if you were back in grade 11 reading Shakespeare and not understanding a single word. But then the bully in school finds the cliff notes for Romeo and Juliet and decides to do a nice thing and share them with everybody. Yep, that makes sense. Good euphemism. That's a good one. Number eight, Khufu's ship. When pharaohs passed on into the afterlife, they put a whole whack of stuff inside their tombs that were meant to come with them into the next plane of existence. It's why we see the mummified versions of their favorite cats and dogs, favorite foods, and tons of treasure. Unfortunately, after you're gone and buried, some opportunistic people are gonna bust down your tomb doors and steal all your stuff. 
I'd like to see those grave robbers steal what Khufu brought with him. In 1954, archaeologists found out that, among other things, Khufu had a 140 foot boat with his name on it, buried in pieces at the base of the Great Pyramid where he was entombed. It was almost perfectly intact, and after digging it out of the ground, they put it on display at the Solar Boat Museum, right next to where it was buried. Hopefully, that's close enough for Khufu to still use it in the afterlife. Number 7 Mummy Workshop Here's a recent discovery for you. Archaeologists in 2018 discovered a well preserved embalming workshop complete with labeled oils. Ooh. What's an embalming workshop, you ask? Well, it's the place where kings go to shed a few pounds. Ooh. By that, I mean have their organs removed to be pickled in jars for the afterlife. My favorite part of this process is removing the brain. Because, you know, you don't need that. Lots of folks walk around without those all the time. Basically, you get a long hook surgical tool and you find the good pink stuff up here through the nose. After stirring the pharaoh's memories like an Italian baker mixing bread dough, you flip the royal over and just let that all drain out until she's empty. I legitimately get queasy when talking about the stuff, that's not a joke, I, I seriously do. But you know what, I'm glad we found the place and smarter people than I understand it. All I know is that if an Egyptian embalmer asks you to lick the spoon, you say no. Don't do it. Number 6. Construction Manifest You know, a lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries. But like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? You know? What stumped people about the pyramids is how they were built. So for our next discovery, how about the discovery of a port in 2013 that had a piece of papyri? Isn't that so much more exciting than a massive 138 meter tall building? Mm -hmm. The piece of papyri actually was a sort of manifesto for those massive buildings. It basically said, the limestone used in the Great Pyramid was shipped from a quarry at Tura to Giza along the Nile River. It also said that it took four days, and it talked a little bit about how long Khufu was in charge of Egypt and the guy who was in charge of building the pyramids. See, it's, it's very exciting. Number 5. Can't take it with you. In life, you live and then you pass on. If you believe in the home sense signs your mom hangs up in her kitchen, then there's going to be a lot of living, laughing, and loving with that. Ancient Egyptians believed in taking things with them to the afterlife. Yeah, pretty much everything was coming with them. Gold, treasure, organs, except the brain, and pretty much just anything you would need for that kind of adventure. Well, animals were no different. Oftentimes when discovering tombs of kings in the main chamber, or sometimes in their own, were statues of cats and dogs, and naturally, mummified kitties and doggies. Now, I love my pets just as much as the next guy, but uh, a discovery in 2019 revealed a tomb with statues, mummies, and even some preserved crocodiles. Ooh, weird, that's a weird pet. Number four, Tomb KV5. Sometimes you pass things off without giving them the proper time and attention. Like the fact that your middle toe on one of your feet is a little longer than the same one on the other side, and you're like, ah, it's probably fine, but it's actually a mutation that all of your ancestors had, and it's the reason you can walk faster than everyone else. Not that that's happened to me or anything, but the archaeologists of Tomb KV5 know what I'm talking about, sort of. Basically, KV5 was not studied very well, and in 1995, it turns out that it was actually one of the largest tombs ever created in the Valley of the Kings. So far, we have found around 121 chambers and corridors, and we think there will be 150 total. The tomb was used for the sons of Ramses II, who as we know had over 100 kids, so the size of the tomb kind of checks out. So far, we've only confirmed six, but there are likely to be around 20 of his sons down there. Number three, the Pyramids of Giza. A lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries. But like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? Okay, obviously people can see these bad boys from miles away. It would be kind of hard to lose something like that, as Adam said. But then again, as a man, I take pride in losing my car keys every time I need to use them. But more specifically, it was the discovery of the inner chambers of the pyramids that really kicked off archaeology. The verdict? Well, these pyramids not only hold riches and riches of historical knowledge, but the engineering involved is out of this world, which, you know, is kind of how some people think they were constructed today. The complexity and craftsmanship, 
The complexity and craftsmanship still has people scratching their heads. As for me, I believe that with enough careful planning and engineering, mixed in with a whole heap of uh, forced labor, you can just get about anything done. There's still much to be learned about these giants in the desert. Ooh. Number two, Aten. Even today, we are still making huge discoveries in Egypt. I mean, maybe not specifically today, April 27th, or whenever you watch this, but in this day and age. In 2020, we discovered a 3,000 year old city buried in the sand, and it's probably the biggest discovery since our number one spot. The city named Aten, or the Rise of Aten, is the largest city of its kind that we have found and gives us a really good look at life during Egypt's most profitable era. That would be the rule of Amon. That would be the rule of Amenhotep III. Amenhotep IV is his son, who would drastically change the country's direction. Following his father's death, the fourth changed his name to Akhenaten, abandoned the old Egyptian gods besides the sun god Aten, and moved the royal seat from Thebes to the new city of Akhetaten, which is known as Amarna. He was a weird one, but this city wasn't weird. It was impressive, with an administration area as well as residential districts, production area where mud bricks, amulets, and other goods for buildings and temples were made, along with a bakery. Yeah, I love my croissants covered in sand too. Number one, King Tut, the man, the myth, the legend. Besides the pyramids, the sand, and the hot sun, nothing is more famous out of Egypt than King Tut. Well, why is this? Is he not just another royal bro who's just big chillin' in his tomb? Eh, yeah, sort of, but his tomb is very unique actually. Unfortunately for Egyptians and archaeologists alike, a lot of the tombs have been cleaned out by grave robbers and crooks, some of which are just long gone. The stuff could have been heisted at any point really, we're just not sure. King Tut's tomb however was pretty well untouched, and because of this, we got the chance to learn about a king who really didn't do too much. I think his sarcophagus stands out the most, the, the gold and the blue, it's beautiful. I love it, it's good aesthetic. Number 10, construction. We can't talk about ancient Egypt and the mystery still unsolved there if we don't start on how the hell these things were built. And also, it's not just like three pyramids. There's 118 of these things. When did they have time to construct all of these? Ropes, pulley systems, yeah, I'm not convinced. Ramps, ramps. Ramps would have been a mile long against the pyramid's height. That's like hundreds of years right there. You ever dug a hole in your backyard? Two feet. It's like six hours right there and a sore back. Some have theorized a water hydraulic system was used to transport the carved rocks up slopes and tubes with tidal power. Okay, better, better. But like how did they line up the rocks so perfectly and so square at the top? One inch off and every carpenter knows that's going to shift everything. Also, the alignment to true north, the odd coincidences with the dimensions resembling the cosmos, they couldn't have known back then, you know? Buckle up, it's only gonna get weirder. Number nine, Chamber of Secrets. In 2017, scientists were able to peek inside the Great Pyramid finally using modern day physics. Particles, actually. What they found revealed numerous hidden secret chambers and rooms that were thought to never exist. The most bizarre discoveries was a massive unknown void nearly 100 feet long that lays just above the pyramid's grand gallery. Khufu, also known as the Great Pyramid, was received the most attention due to its size and age, but it wasn't the only chamber they found. No, gold, mummies, manuscripts, ancient technology. What lies inside these voids? Also, how the hell did they floor and roof a room that's unaccessible? How do you build that inside such a small chamber already? Muon tomography uses cosmic rays of muons and generates a 3D image through nearly any material. This technology is groundbreaking, literally. Uh, here we go. Yep, found it, there it is. Number eight, the Saqqara Temple. The Pyramid of Djoser, also known as the Step Pyramid, is an archeological site in the Saqqara Necropolis. The discovery of a 4,400 year old tomb now seen as UNESCO's World Heritage Site is the six tier, four sided structure, which very well may be the earliest colossal stone structure in Egypt and possibly the world. Stone mounds were made in Europe for millennia, but it was the pyramid shape that started here. It was built 27th century BC during the third dynasty for the Pharaoh Djoser. The pyramid is the center of a huge complex and an enormous courtyard surrounded by ceremonial structures and decorations. Its architect was created from the Egyptian architect himself, Imhotep, the high priest of the god Ra. This guy was like the building man 
manager, you know? The head architect. In fact, wasn't even found or really even studied till about the 1920s, and was recently excavated in 2018. The pyramid went through several revisions over the years, and in March 2020, the pyramid was officially reopened for visitors after a 14 year fix up. Check out Netflix, they do a great documentary on this. Number seven, Queen Nefertiti, the queen of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt, the beloved royal wife of Pharaoh Akhenaten. Nefertiti and her husband were known for a religious revolution in which they worshipped solely the sun disk Aten as their one and only god. Oh! Blasphemy! She reigned during what was arguably the wealthiest and most lavish period of, of ancient Egypt. Here's the weird part. We don't know where she is. Usually kings and queens are buried in very spiritual, very high ranked places like the royal tomb. Easy to find. But nope, no one can find her. Or even know what happened to her. In 2015, archaeologists thought with high resolution scans, voids that are behind the walls of Tutankhamun's tomb proposed maybe that she was there. Nope, no Nefertiti. In 2003, archaeologists thought through the hair DNA, Nefertiti's mom may have been quote the younger lady. Nope. Turns out it was just Tutankhamun's mom. So what exactly happened to this famously revered queen? Who knows? Aliens dude. When in doubt, always aliens. You know what I mean? Number 6. King Tut's death. When archaeologists opened a sarcophagus in Egypt's Valley of the Kings for the first time in 1923, it was the discovery of a lifetime. The ancient Egyptian boy king, King Tutankhamun, the burial chamber of the 19 year old who ruled 3,300 years ago. But why did he die so young? DNA tests and CT scans show he suffered from malaria, a broken leg, and congenital deformities associated with inbreeding, common amongst royalty. Ouch. Because of his tomb's extremely small size, historians think King Tut's death must have been unexpected, and his burial rushed by A, who succeeded him as a pharaoh. The tomb's chambers were packed to the brim with more than 5,000 artifacts including furniture, chariots, clothes, weapons, and 130 of the king's walking sticks. A 24 pound solid gold mask was placed over him and he was laid in a series of containers, three golden coffins, and a granite sarcophagus. His death still has scientists scratching their heads. Also, look up how many archaeologists died months after the cursed tomb had been raided. Yeah, you don't want to know. Number five, the lost labyrinth. Archaeologists uncovered what's believed to be the remains of a long lost labyrinth below the sand of the pyramid of Hawara, known as quote, the labyrinth. Built by Amenhet III, it was the most visited sites of the ancient world. Greek Herodotus claimed to have counted 3,000 rooms in the pyramid's funeral complex during the 5th century BC. According to them, the underground temple consists of over 3,000 rooms filled with remarkable hieroglyphics and paintings. Close, too, located less than 100 kilometers from Cairo. In 2008, with the aid of ground penetrating technology, a Belgian Egyptian expedition was able to confirm the presence of an enormous underground temple. With no visible remains, the story was thought to be a legend passed down until Egyptologists uncovered its foundations in the 1800s. The results of this expedition indicate the presence of grid-like structures deep beneath the sand. Please tell me there's no minotaur just running around down there. Okay. Number four, the mystery queen. Archaeologists have unearthed a tomb of a previously unknown queen believed to have been the wife of Pharaoh Neferefra, who ruled 4,500 years ago. The tomb was discovered in Abu Sur, an old kingdom necropolis southwest of Cairo, where there are several pyramids dedicated to the pharaohs of the fifth dynasty. The name of his wife had not been known until recently. She was Kenta Kaz, renowned as the mother of two Egyptian pharaohs. Kenta Kaz I is a mysterious woman who ruled in the fourth dynasty and has archaeologists puzzled at her burial complex in Giza. Though rough evidence for ancient Egyptian queens, the remains of this female leader were undisturbed for two millennia within the necropolis until its excavation in the late 1930s. Hieroglyphic inscriptions concerning her title had been discovered and subsequently became open for interpretation. Her title was initially regarded to be quote, King of Upper and Lower Egypt and quote, Mother of King of Upper and Lower Egypt. So who was this mysterious powerful figure in ancient Egypt? Who was she? Number three, the Dendrolites. All these tombs and underground chambers, how the hell did they see anything under there? Well, we really don't know, but we have some sort of direction. These ancient battery looking light bulbish things could have maybe been the power source. Ancient Egypt seems to be full of keyholes, drill holes, and shafts that are literally impossible without high powered tools. Most people say aliens, me included, but I also say 
the Dendera light bulbs. They've been theorized as being some sort of battery. The Hawthor Temple at Dendera contains several relief depictions, Harsumtus in the form of a snake, emerging from a lotus flower. The Dendera light is a variation of this mode of showing Harsumtus in an oval container, a snake inside, taking a number of humans to lift, and it holds apparent meanings of the start of creation. Look, I don't care what you say, this thing is a light bulb. It's got a filament. And coils? Come on, drill holes? They couldn't have just lit fires underground? The smoke? The heat? I don't think so. Now, a couple of DeWalts. <laughs> just sanding up the pyramids real nice, you know? Who knows? Who knows? Number two. The city of Punt. The land of Punt, or the ancient city of Punt, was an ancient kingdom sometime back then. A trading partner of ancient Egypt. It was known for producing and exporting gold, aromatic resins, precious stones, black wood, ivory, you name it. The region is known from ancient Egyptian records of trade expeditions. At time, Punt is referred to as the land of God. No pressure, archaeologists. The exact location of Punt is debated and unknown by historians. Q Indiana Jones movie. Various locations have been offered southeast of Egypt, a Red Sea coastal region, Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, no one really knows. First deciphered in Egyptian hieroglyphics in 1822, scholars began reading Egyptian texts and the mystery got mystery -er. That's not a word. More questions arose as to where Punt was located and what happened to it. The land of Punt is written by voyagers as being praised for its lavish riches and goodness of land. Okay, so it exists somewhere. This is awesome, isn't it? Would it suck if we already found everything? We're going on an expedition, boy. Grab your things, let's go. And coming in at the number one spot, the Sphinx. Where do I even start? Known as the oldest carved rock like ever, its age is debated literally every day due to the questions it asks scholars. Was it wind erosion? Water erosion? How many times was this thing broken and rebuilt? The Great Sphinx of Giza, the limestone statue of a reclining sphinx, a mythical creature with a head of a human and the body of a lion. Facing directly west to east, it stands on the Giza Plateau on the west bank of the Nile. The face of the sphinx appears to represent the pharaoh Khafre, although this is heavily debated as wrong gears and looking nothing like him. It's since been restored with tons of layers of limestone blocks, although still unfixed. Its nose was broken off for unknown reasons between the 3rd and 10th century. Maybe some artillery fire over the years? Who knows? The Sphinx is the oldest known sculpture in Egypt, and archaeologists suggest that it was created in the Old Kingdom using unknown construction methods. Yeah, definitely that battery thing. From 1817 to 1930, this thing was buried up to its neck and written and drawn about for centuries. I wonder what other secrets lay under her right now. I guess we'll eventually find out someday. Yeah.